Greetings! Welcome back once again. This is Imuna Yisrael, affectionately known as the First Lady for Debate Talk for you. We appreciate all the listeners, male and female, who support the Relationship Challenge and our newest edition and sister show, Under the Palm, Hebrew Women Speak. So sisters, if you have something to share or desire to be featured on the Debate Talk for You platform, please send all requests to underthepalm2 at gmail.com. Once again, ladies, that's underthepalm, the number two, at gmail.com. We appreciate you and hope to hear from you soon. My first special guest, he's been in the show several times before, you know, Inside the Lions Den, uh, also uh, another segment of the show, but he is back. This is one of the brothers from the Shield Squad. This is Vocab Malone. Welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, man? Sal, thanks for having me on. Can you hear me all right? Hey, you loud and clear. You loud and clear. Uh, anything you want to say to the people before? Anything you want to say to the people before we begin? Nah. Uh, well, yeah. Okay, yeah. What we're trying to do tonight is a different format. I propose to lead to hopefully greater things, and the format is almost like get to know you type of thing, because. Uh, I think both Ron and I feel that not everybody on sort of the other side of the aisle, so to speak, uh, fully grasps maybe the nuances, the different avenues of our theology and philosophy. So tonight, by the questions we ask each other, it's supposed to be an interview. Uh, I interview him, he interviews me. Hopefully, people will say, okay, I understand what this person believes about X, Y, Z. So I hope it's informative and can move the conversation forward between Christians and self-identified Hebrew Israelites. That's what's up. All right, had a little setup with difficulty with the sound effects there, but uh, we got it working <laughs> right on the base off you. My next special guest has been in the show before as well. Uh, and he is, here, he is here once again tonight on Debate Talk You Radio. Once again, it's my brother, Ron, Devon Prospect. Welcome to the show. Shalom, shalom, peace, family. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Um, like uh, Vocab Malone says, this is a What Do You Believe questionnaire uh, segment uh, in which we ask each other questions. We're trying to ascertain what each other believes. Uh, I want to thank the host, Al Showtime, for having me on the show. And, um, Given that I have like the 60 seconds or whatever, what I just want to lay out before we start, just so that the audience is clear with the objectives um, and they know what's going on. Uh, my objective is to use a question and design research method to obtain quantitative and qualitative data to base my conclusion off of in regards to vocab, ascertain vocab alone's Christian worldview without drawing straw man arguments, and to see how the flaws in its foundational prevalence can be resolved by borrowing from my own worldview. I know my brother Vocab uh, wants to distinguish my doctrine from one West by asking loaded questions derived from his experience in his new book, which I read. He will be using a questionnaire design research method as well to obtain the same amount of data, and he will commence several presuppositional logical fallacies, which will dictate his line of questioning. But we'll sort through it a little bit, and we'll see what the brother has in store for us so that we both can be edified with our um, prospective audiences. All right. Once again, that's Ron Devine Prospect. We appreciate the brother. Uh, as explained, uh, it's going to be more of an interview style. Uh, they're going to interview each other. Uh, everybody agreed to 15 minutes each. Uh, and of course, we have a portion where we go to the audience. And uh, when we get to the audience, I just want to make it clear, um, and we all agree to it uh, over the phones, behind the scenes, that once we get to the audience, once we get to you guys, uh, when it's time to ask questions, just please make sure when you ask your questions, it's pertaining to what's being asked. You know, in relation, you know, pertaining to the topic, of course. You know, if you stray away and talk about something that's totally, you know, away from the topic, a both special guest has the right to pass on your call. Uh, you know, basically, basically stay on topic. <laughs> so again, when we get to the call, uh, the question part, uh, at, when we let the audience call in by dialing that number three one nine five two seven six two three nine. Make sure whatever question you ask is pertaining to the topic or whatever is being asked. You know, in relation to the show. All right, so we're going to get it started. Uh, let me just set this timer up real quick. And I see people pressing number one already. If you, uh, if you have a question or a comment, you can do that. You can press number one and stand by. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that portion of the show. 
you know, I'm going to go down in order and get some of your questions and your comments. So I appreciate the people that are standing by. Call in via phone, call in via Skype. Again, that number is 319 527 6239. So let's start the interview process. And we open up both brothers' phone lines and 15 minutes. Go ahead, brothers. All right. It sounds like Divine Prospect does want us to be a debate. Vocabulary commit several logical fallacies, dude. <laughs> but all right, let's do this. I look forward to interviewing. All right. Uh, I want to ask a few questions about divine revelation. Um, do you believe that the creator of the universe has given us revelation on the planet Earth? Has he given divine revelation? Yes. Where do you believe this divine revelation is contained? Say, uh, we talk about the uh, Elohim of Israel. The majority of it is contained within what we call the Tanakh and uh, also the Brit Hadashah. Within the New Covenant books, generally counted as 27, do you view them all as on an equal canonical status as the Tanakh? No. Which ones are of a lesser status? The Pauline Epistles. Um, also, second and third John, which is doubtful, which was considered doubtful before it became part of the canon later on. Um, second Peter, also considered doubtful, which was uh, called the canon later on. The book of Revelation, which is questionable because it's highly subjective. Um, and aside from that, everything else should be game uh, with conditional exceptions to Luke and Acts. Um, do you believe that Paul speaks with any authority or when he writes a letter to a church, what does it constitute? What's the nature of the authority or lack thereof? So Paul's authority, uh, as he states in Galatians chapter 2, was given to him to go and preach what's called the quote-unquote gospel of Christ, the, un- the uncircumcised, which should be the goyim or the Gentiles, or the ethnos, depending upon how you want to label it, whether it's Hebrew or Greek. So his audience is geared toward those individuals where his objective was to give them an opportunity to cleave unto the house of Israel in the last days so they could be grafted in as a wild olive branch, and that individuals from those nations, not those nations as a whole, can be brought in underneath the Hebrew Israelite uh, uh, individuals. So Paul's authority is mostly towards those individuals. The circumcision was to be taught by uh, Kephas, uh, uh, Yaakov, James, Yaakov, okay. John, um, and the apostles. Thank you. Thank you. Do do any of the New Testament documents contain errors in them? Uh, when you say errors, are you talking about textual variants? Are you talking about misspelling? No, 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 no. I, I, I know I do not mean manuscript. I mean, if you had the autograph uh, in front of you uh, of First Corinthians, would it have errors? For example, do any of the New Testament well, documents would, have errors of fact? Yeah. Well, if I had the autographs in front of me, then there would be no errors because I would have something directly from the author himself. We don't have so that. Do you today. believe? Yes, I know, I know, I know this. But do you, so, but, but see, are you saying that the error? You're saying you don't accept Paul as canonical is because you believe copyist errors have changed what he wrote, or because he simply doesn't have the authority, no matter if he had the autograph or not. Uh, his authority would be lessened, and it would not be authoritative to me because I don't consider myself a Gentile. If I was, then maybe that would be a different conversation. Um, but okay. in regards to the follow-up to that question you asked, um, in regards to uh, his manuscripts today having copious errors, I would say that because we don't have the original, we're looking at thousands of manuscripts. So it's very hard mm-hmm. for any of the books right. in the Bible. Can I ask you, we have can I ask you a question start. about that? But So that's the case with the, the Tanakh as well. So And it actually, it, the I Tanakh think. is older. So so do you believe that the 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 part for example with the Tanakh do you believe that the Tanakh is an errant or that it does have errors of fact in it? Um, I don't believe that any part of the text is an errant because we don't have the autographs. So when you make an argument from the text, uh, do you do you believe they are all provisional arguments? Uh, to a, to a certain degree, um, arguments from text would be based on the amount of textual criticism I have done to various texts. So depending upon how do many you, manuscripts... Can I, could I ask you a real quick follow-up on that? The, okay. G- Jesus, had, Jesus had access to the Tanakh in his day and quoted from it as if it was God's word. 
Do you believe he was mistaken? Um, I'm not 100% sure, only because I don't know what manuscripts that he would have been using at that time. If it was the Septuagint, we have various variants of the Septuagint. If it was something, let's say it was the Peshitta, we have variants of the Peshitta as well. It would depend on what he had in front of him at that time. Okay. Thank you. Do you believe that these questions kind of switch from divine revelation to creation? Do you believe that there was a historical Adam who was made in the image of God? According to Better Sheet, yes. Okay. Um, do you believe that this Adam was a special creation from the dust of the ground or that he emerged from primates before him? Uh, he was not emerged from primates before him. Hominids was already on the scene before he existed. So he was a special creation that the Most High person got involved with. In a discussion you had on the Bay Talk for You when you were on the hot seat, you said you were a theistic evolutionist. In what way are you a theistic evolutionist? What do you believe uh, God used evolution to create, if not Adam? So when I, sure. Well, when it comes to Adam, um, when he created Adam, Adam, according to the uh, literature itself, stated that he was cognitive of the creator. He was able to communicate and talk. He was able to walk. He was a bipedal creature. He was able to walk. Um, Adam was also sociable because he was given a, a wife, or Isha as well. Uh, he was also able to name the animals, so that means he was uh, right. soulish, that he can relate Could to I the animals. I, I want to make sure I, I rephrase it. I might have asked this because that's going off. What I'm saying is if you're a theistic evolutionist, what are the elements of creation that God used evolution to end up in the state that they are? Because you said you're a theistic evolutionist. So what in creation, not Adam, you said, but what in creation do you believe God used the process of evolution for then? Okay, so now you switch it over to not Adam. Initially, it was Adam, and that's why I was going no, over no, that. No, the first question was about Adam, and after I understood, so after you, I understood that you said not Adam, I'm asking about the rest of creation in relationship right, so, to evolution. Yes, yeah, so in regards to theistic evolution, there are certain processes that the Most High put in place so that creation can take care of itself. Um, and these processes as well was changed when there was corruption brought into the world because of the fall of Adam, quote-unquote. Um, so a lot of things that are occurring today that we see things such as genetic drift, uh, such things such as uh, what we would call um, microevolution, not necessarily macroevolution, the adaptation of certain animals um, that we see today are all forms of this theistic evolution. So this is okay, the process that is placed for are animals you a theistic to are you a theistic evolutionist or an old earth creationist? Because you've historically said both, but those are not the same positions. For example, you said you adopt the Hugh Ross and Reasons to Believe creation model, but they, they debate on a regular basis BioLogos, who is a theistic evolutionist organization. So which one are you? Are you an old earth creationist or a theistic evolutionist? Those are two okay, different so things. Yes, I'm, I'm completely aware of that. So in regards to me saying that my stance leans more to theistic evolution, I made a reference to Hugh Roth's video where Hugh Roth was going into the in regards to the cosmogony story and how certain processes was put in place by the Most High for things to come into its mature form. So in the day period that we say, which we would say Yom, which consists of a day on the first day, we're looking at that as an age period. So it wasn't everything that happened within a quote-unquote literal 24-hour period. So it's an age period, and in that age, the process that the Most High put in place came to a culmination when that age ceased and ended. So we're looking at the creation week. That is what I mean in regards to theistic evolution. Okay, so sometimes some of these questions I was hoping you could do a direct answer. So if I say, are you an old earth creationist or a theistic evolutionist, it's not exactly clear what you're saying where, but I, I want to move on to the next section because we only have about five minutes or so left. Um, your name, Divine Prospect, what is the theological significance of it? The theological significance of Divine Prospect is the word divine alludes to anything that is at the real supernatural. Um, and prospect, pros in Greek means to motion forward, spect in Greek also is a prefix to mean sight or vision. So the objective is that the Most High has given me spiritual foresight in regards to things and matters that occur as it pertains to the children of Israel here on the earth. Is that why you believe that some of the positions you've arrived to, no one else before you has arrived at because you have this? 
Well, I can never say that. Um, I'm not saying that I am the creator of all things that I teach and say. Uh, that would be very disingenuous for me to say something like that. So you would have I, to not, I wasn't something. saying that. No, I asked a, specific, a more precise question. I said some of the things you've arrived at, no one else before you has arrived at, is it due to divine prospect? I didn't ask about all things. I know you understand your it, it depends on what It depends on what you're talking about. I can't say a oh, blanket statement. Okay. That. So it depends on okay. what specifically you're asking me, and then I can tell you yes or no to that. I teach on okay. a lot of things, so it depends on what you're asking me. Do you believe that it is possible for you to one day become, uh, if you would, I guess, put it in Hebrew, L, as in a divine power? Do you believe that one day that is possible for you personally to do that? To become a divine power while alive or in death? After, after you cease this physical resistance. So in the afterlife, is it possible for you to do that? You specifically. I'm not talking about anyone else or general thing. You, Ron Shields, is it possible you become a power one day yourself? Uh, yes, because that word, that word power that you're using is very broad. So we'd have to actually okay. hone in exactly what you're referring to. But, yes, well, I, the, I believe the reason I'm asking, The reason I'm asking this is because I, I, I've, I'm understanding some of your theology from prior things. That's why I'm asking that specific question. So I, I have a, a general sure. understanding of how you, how you would be using that word. Um, currently, no how many gods, and I know you don't like that word, so we can switch to powers if you like, but how many powers do you believe exist? in the metaphysical or spiritual realm? How many, if you could put a number on it, how many exist? I, c I couldn't put a number on it. But what but I will say to you, because I know what you're getting at, is that there is a council in the heavenly realm. And there is well, a... Well, can I ask, Ron, Ron, please let me ask the questions, though, because I, I know what you're saying. I appreciate you, but I don't want to be preempted. I want to ask my own questions. I, I know what you're trying to do. I'm, I'm not saying it in a negative way, but I have a certain set of questions I want to try to get to. I appreciate your cooperation. Please. Um, I understand you're saying you don't know a number. I respect that. Um, do you believe that any of them are, are uh, eternally existent? Uh, no, all of them had a beginning except for the creator. So I know you won't use this term, I don't think, but Yahweh is self-existent, you believe, correct? Yes, according to his proper name in Hebrew, yes, he is. Did he create all the other powers? Yes, he did. Do you believe that we can know their names? Yes. How do you learn their names? Uh, you would have to read the text as well as comparative other cultural uh, texts that we have access to. So do you believe that Molech has an actual metaphysical ontology, that he actually is an ontological being in some way, Molech? Yes. Okay. Do you believe it is appropriate for any culture, I'm not talking about Israelites, is it appropriate for certain cultures to pay him homage and worship him? Is that appropriate? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you, do you believe that um, if Molech prescribes child sacrifice as part of the ritual worship, since it is appropriate for other cultures to worship him, that child sacrifice should be part of the worship? Um, according to a certain period of time in which it was allowed, yes. So there was a time in which for certain ethnic, ethnicities or certain nations or people groups within, within the groups of people called the Canaanites, some of them it was appropriate for them to, as part of the worship during that time, offer children to Molech, correct? Uh, it would be appropriate as long as the Most High did not give them any instructions to do otherwise. Okay. Um, do you believe that behind Molech is actually a demon? Uh, define demon. Well, I see the thing is, I believe I have what would be a standard understand uh, definition. So maybe I would say fallen angel, evil spirit. But if you have a different uh, definition, yeah. I'll let I'll let you define it. That's fine. You can define your own terms. That's fine. Of yes, course. That, that power would be deemed evil by the children of Israel. Yes. Well, would it be objectively evil? Because uh, I'm sure you understand objective morality, something is actually right or actually wrong. Would it be a, would the, the spirit be objectively w evil? Um, that's difficult to tell um, because if we did it off the literature, it's written by a worldview of particular people. So they viewed it as being evil, and that's subjectively. But okay. most people believe it to be evil. So was it objectively evil, yes or no, to sacrifice children to Molech during the time 
uh, that those those ethnic groups did it? Was it objectively mor- immoral or evil? Or if I say, say from my objective point, I would be neutral on that. Okay. Um, how would you interpret Galatians 4 8 that says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods? You tell me how would I how would I exegete that? All right, family, once again, today's show is entitled What Do You Believe? What do you believe? And excuse that earlier little sound effect malfunction. But also don't know, that was supposed to be the two-minute bell. <laughs> I have it automatically set up. But uh, once again, if you want to hear this sound right here, that means there's two minutes of your time. We had a little malfunction. I don't know. Hopefully, Blog Talk Radio looks that out. But again, people, the number is 319-527-6239. And uh, once again, I see a lot of people who uh, social media sharing this on their personal page. You know, we appreciate the family out there that's tuning in to the Bay Talk Radio. Uh, once again, my special guest is Vocab Malone and Ron Devon Prospect. So let's begin the uh, next portion, of, well, actually the same portion of the interview process. Uh, now we're going to go to Ron Devon Prospect uh, to ask your questions. Go ahead. You can ask your questions, Ron. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, you there, Vocab? Yes, sir. All right, so let's get started. So, Vocab, do you subscribe to the information in the following books for your doctrine of progressive covenantalism? And if so, can you refer to a systematic theological course on this specific data? The book called Kingdom Through Covenants by Peter J. Gentry and Stephen J. Wellam and Progressive Covenantalism by Stephen J. Wellam and Brent E. Parker. Yes, uh, I would say that by and large, you never agree with everything any given author writes about everything, but by and large, I would say yes. What would you object to in that book? Um. So this this just, uh, just specific give me, just thing. Just three points. Just three points. Well, there's there's one specific thing that uh, I'm not sure if how deep they go into it in the book, but I know it from other talks that they've given. It's it's. It's a different interpretation of aspects of the end of Romans in relationship to what it means all Israel be saved. Within progressive covenantalism, there's some differences about what that exact uh, phrase means. There's, so there's flexibility within that interpretive schema. And I know that okay. I, I think I would have a little more leaning towards Israel than I've heard Gentry and Wellam give. Okay, second point. That. Um, well, so I don't, I don't know if this is stated explicitly in the book, but uh, uh, in various times, Gentry has said that he views theonomists as false teachers. I think that's a little harsh. I don't think that uh, theonomy equals uh, false teaching. Okay, and third point? Honestly, those are the two big ones uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I'm trying to look for my copy. Okay, cool, of the no book. problem. So, so have you read both books cover to cover? Progressive covenantalism, yeah. Kingdom to covenant, not cover to cover, no. Okay, if you want a copy of it, let me know. All right, so no, no, um, I got, I got a copy. I got a oh, copy. You do? I just, okay. I'm, okay. Yeah, yeah. No problem. I've read both of them. All right. Um, so, regarding the tripartite distinction of law, how does this fit into your progressive covenantalism paradigm? Could you explain that question? I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Okay, so are you aware of what tripartite distinction is? Yeah, you're talking about the idea of uh, different ways to d- determine what sort of is for this covenant and what's not, that type of thing? No, actually what it does is that it categorizes the Mosaic law. Um, yeah, and not so just civil, the yeah, like law. civil, religious, things like that. Let me, let me just uh, reemphasize. Not just exclusively the uh, Mosaic law, but just universal law as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's there's three categories. Are you aware of those three categories? Yeah, moral, civil, ceremonial. Okay, excellent. All right, and um, how does that cater to your progressive covenantalism worldview? What is your take on that? Right, so um, it's, it's not... 
the classic division is not identical in every way, but it doesn't mean that it's totally um, useless either. So there's a lot of nuances and and sort of some of the differentiations. But I but I can say this: all of the law is is moral. But at the end of the day, there is something that's a new covenant and there's something that's an old covenant. But I mean, I could give examples. Of okay, wait, wait, laws. okay. Hold on. So you said all law is moral. Is that correct? Yeah, all law is all law is moral. Ultimately. Even the Mosaic law, that's also all moral, correct? Ultimately is moral because it's a reflection of God's character, yes. Okay, so if you were looking at the, three, the breakdown of all three, which would be the ceremonial law, the civil law, and the moral law, which one do you believe still stands and which one do you believe has ceased? <laughs> well, uh, so the problem is, in some of these, it's how do you um, categorize some of them. There's a challenge with that. But I, I think one thing, I like to start with the clear and then move out to the less clear. So, for example, I believe we can give examples that are clear from the New Covenant Scriptures of things in the Mosaic laws that are clearly no longer in force for believers in this covenant time or dispensation, although I'm not a fan of that word because it's been misused. Examples would be circumcision. Um, some of the food and purity regulations, uh, sacrifices, temple worship, uh, Passover, and, to and this a certain is all ceremonial. Extent, um, well, they they well. So here's what it works. God is the same yesterday, you know, today, all that, right? He doesn't change. He's immutable. That's that's a that's a agreed upon aspect. But the Iron Age is different than the Bronze Age, and the 20th century is different than the 21st century. And not only that. Since the covenants are progressive, that's where the system gets its name from. Since the covenants are progressive, the covenants are actually new. They're not identical. Otherwise, there'd be no need to actually give another covenant. So they're all, all right. moral in a so, certain so, sense. So we're going to put the sense. ceremonial laws. So the ceremonial laws, do you believe those laws still are in existence, or have they ceased due to the new covenant? Uh, by and large, when you get into ceremonial law, it's mainly been, as, as the writer of Hebrews says, disannulled. So it's been this and So are we talking about 80%, 90%, 12% approximately? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't have a quant. I mean, I don't think you'll find any book that has some, a quantitative de- data analysis like that. I don't, I don't, I don't have that. What I'm I would written, do is I'm, I would, I would written on it and I'll show it to you. So let's move to the second one. So civil law. Well, if you were looking at civil law in regards to the tripartite distinction of law in regards to ancient Israel, do you believe that the civil law also has ceased? Or do you believe elements of it still exist even in the uh, New Covenant? Right. So I want to make sure – so I know we, we're talking about tripart, uh, the threefold division there. But could you define, as, as you understand – I want to make sure I'm answering the question you're asking. How are you defining civil law, please? All right. So I'll, uh, now you're asking me a question, but I'll be generous. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's, I'm just – well, I'm just trying to understand. Okay. I mean, I don't want to assume. Let me answer it. Hold on, because I'm living in time. So in regards to ceremonial law, anything that has to do with a sacrifice would be ceremonial law, okay? So offering a sacrifice for a particular sin that you commit, that would be ceremonial law. Uh, anything in regards to being unclean, that would be part of the ceremonial law. The civil law has anything to do with the political regime, political system, such as paying tithes or giving tithes unto the priest for the sustainability of the temple. Uh, things such as not to uh, okay. deceive or rob your neighbor in regards to things such as interest when your neighbor asks you for a loan for something. And then when we go to the moral law, it would be things such as uh, do on your neighbor until you do unto yourself, and we would look at things such as the Ten Commandments, don't steal, don't kill, etc. So these are the three tiered layers in regards to the tripartite distinction of law, and in regards to progressive covenantalism, there's a particular way in which this is discerned. So I need to ascertain what your position is so I know further questions in order to interrogate you. So okay. knowing that, let me move on. Let me move on. So what is the, can you please define the quote-unquote law of Christ? And once you define it, is it codified in the text? And if so, what does it consist of? Well, ultimately the law of Christ is love. I mean, that's, that's sort of the ultimate biblical uh, aspect. And then you see key places in which that's sort of worked out. What does it mean to obey the law of Christ, which ultimately, again, is love? Um, I believe the New Testament gives hints all throughout it, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't spell out every single thing. And that's where the Spirit of God is, is present in those who are New Covenant believers 
and taking the general equity already laid therein of God's previous, previously given sacred writ, we make application in our context. So are you saying that the law of Christ, quote-unquote, can be subjective from one group of believers to the other? If not, then where could they look at in the text to know for certain what they are to do and not to do in regards to keeping the law of Christ? Or is it just an area of pneumatology where the ruach or the, the pneuma or the spirit would have to lead that person in order to know what is right and what is wrong according to the law of Christ? Right. So those are good questions, but... I think they come out of more of an old covenant understanding because we're looking for uh, the letter of the law. We're looking for numbers. We're looking for, for percentages. We're looking for uh, a paint by the numbers, but that's no longer the way the new covenant works. And that's why Jeremiah said, uh, since these covenant members will all have a new, a new heart, uh, you won't have to be teaching them in the same way. It doesn't mean they don't get taught anything, but it's, it's saying in relationship to this. So Paul mentions this idea of law of Christ a bunch of times. It's in Romans, it's in Galatians, and it has some elasticity to it, meaning he doesn't use it in an identical way every time. But I think you can get a general sense of what he means by it, and I think generally it's summed up with love. I mean the, the New Covenant teaching is that that is the greatest command. So what you're looking for, I don't think Christians um, can offer basically. I don't think it's part of what the New Covenant is about anymore the the kind of all right system so to me it just sounds like is this organization and not being very clear because various churches can also distinguish how they felt they're being led by the ruach and how they deem love to be love is an abstract term you cannot weigh it it's not scientific it's nothing in order to outline exactly what love is if all the law of christ is, is just love so i see that as being very flawed but um, let's move forward. So what? going into Love is, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. you can't ask your question back. Let me move forward. So the next question is, why did Paul say or quote my gospel in regards to Romans two sixteen, Romans sixteen twenty five, Philippians four and fifteen, second Timothy two and eight, and why did he give his opinion? An example would be first Corinthians chapter seven, verses six to seven and twelve, which contradicts Peter's instruction in first Peter four and eleven, which says, Let any man that speaks speak as if he's the oracles of the most high. Right. So let's go to a specific example. You said 1 Corinthians seven twelve. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord. And then he goes on to talk about what you should do in relationship to divorce and unbelieving and all that. I won't read it because I want to save your time. Um, but what's happening there is Paul is exercising his apostolic prerogative. See, this isn't saying this is my opinion, therefore it's worthless. What he's saying is I don't have a direct teaching from Jesus here. And the way you know that is go up to verse 10. To the married, I give discharge, not I, but the Lord. So the beauty of this is Paul is saying, when I have something from Christ, I tell you and I say it. But then he says, now I say this myself. But the thing is, if you read throughout Paul's letters, he says that believers should be reading them aloud during liturgy, so during the service, during worship service, and he says they must obey them. He says, I have the Spirit of God also. So he's not downplaying his own spiritual authority there. He's just differentiating from what's directly from Christ, what we have available in the Evangelion, the gospel, and what is he is saying, this is something I am giving you via my own authority. So that's what's going on so, there. So let me um, ask you a question. So if he gives us something via his authority, do we have to subject ourselves to it? Yes, as one, as an apostle born out of undue time, nonetheless, he is an apostle who does have that authority, certainly. And the beauty of Galatians is it's all about that because it shows how the pillars, so-called, of the early Jerusalem church recognized that and, in fact, even had to be corrected. I mean it's not an accident that the Holy Spirit guided Paul to write 13 of the epistles, whereas Peter wrote two. So there was a special calling that Paul had, and that's, that's something – Well, that what I would say to that is – only what has been codified in the canon. So more could have been written, right? But this is only what has been codified in the canon that we have access to today. So if you're saying that Paul gives his opinion, that the opinion is equated to his apostolic authority and we should subject ourselves to it, then why did not Paul just say, I give you this command from the Most High since he was divinely inspired by the Ruach to speak? Can you answer that? Yeah, I didn't say it was Paul's opinion. I did not say that. I said it was Paul's uh, – what, what I was getting at is it's actually Paul's ruling. It's something he's actually saying that is authoritative. It's not just a mere opinion. And the irony of – I know you discount Second Peter, but I don't think most of the audience does. Peter references Paul's writings as 
scripture. He says, the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scripture. That's grapha hetero. And so we have two things, and Peter recognizes Paul's writing as apostolic, authoritative, and scripture. Okay, so I advise the audience to go and research Second Peter so they can understand what I mean when I say doubtful in regards to the canonization of the text in which you have referenced earlier being 27 books of the New Testament. So why did Paul say my gospel? Why is he personalizing and using the genitive to say my gospel? So let's look at um, Romans 2.16 is one example you gave, right? That's correct. Right. Um, so there is a there is an aspect. So you mentioned genitive that shows possession. So that th- is certainly true. That uh, th- it depends how you look at it. It's like this. It is true that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. So he's not saying things that are contradictory. For example, to James, that the classic charge has been labeled but their law, but that's that's incorrect. But he he is sort of specializing in uh, gospeling, if you want to use that term, the Gentiles. There's one aspect. Another aspect is that. He, he wasn't there. He was one born out of undue time. So his, his situation with the, the Lord on the, on, on, that, on the Damascus Road is different than the other apostles. It's, it's a different situation with him. So it's very specific and personal. That's why he says, I didn't receive this from any man. He didn't hear it passed down. It was direct from the Lord. It was different than the other 12. And so well, well hold on. Reason. I would say that the other 12 sat under Yahusha for the duration of the time that they were his disciples, and they received that directly from him as well. But my question is, when he personalizes things, when he says this is a command for me, and not a command from, from the Lord, but for me and my... All right, once again, it's Debate Talk for you, family, the number 319-527-6239. Hopefully you're taking down some notes and you're enjoying this uh, interview process between Ron Divine Prospect and Vocab Malone. So now, actually, we're going to go to the audience out there. We're gonna, we agreed that we're going to give the audience 20 minutes uh, for this uh, particular part. Uh, we, of course, we're going to come back and get some more uh, questions on uh, from the family out there that's tuning in via phone or via Skype. Again, the number is 319-527-6239. Again, like I mentioned earlier, when you ask your questions, make sure it's pertaining to what's been asked or, you know, the, in relation to the topic. Uh, if not, uh, both special guests, if they want to, they can move on to the next question. But it's up to them. But uh, let's go to the phone line right now. Let's go to 904-250. You're live in there. Uh, Shalom. This is uh, Brother Sean out of Jacksonville, Florida. Shalom to the uh, Ron and uh, hello to Mr. Vocab Malone. Uh, my question was actually for Mr. Vocab Malone. When it comes to the authority of Paul, do you, do you believe that his authority is for Israelites as well, or is it just specifically for the Gentiles? And uh, that is pretty much my question. Thank you and shalom. It is, it is to both, and one evidence I would give of that is that almost all the congregations that Paul wrote to that he expected to obey his letters um, were mixed. They were not one or the other by and large. I mean, uh, so that's a key evidence I would give to that. All right. That's all okay. 904. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, well, actually, you know what? Well, well, with that, actually, I'll, I'll also ask this. So if his authority was for, for both Gentiles as well as the Israelites, then where does that place Peter and James – when it comes to those letters that they sent off to the Israelites, they don't seem to, they actually don't seem to dismiss the law as much as it seems Paul does. So if the authority, so if, well, the, if the agreement in Acts 15 was, that, was for James to tell Paul, hey, you go to the Gentiles, we'll deal with the circumcision, or we'll deal with the Israelites, you go to the Gentiles, then how is it that you're saying that, they have a, that Paul himself has authority over both Jews and Gentiles? Like, what, what well, is the I point think, of, of James and Jacob writing at all of this? I'm sorry, of James and, and Peter writing at all? Well, there's a th- – let me answer the, the last question. Um, okay. Just like with the old covenant documents, uh, in the new covenant documents, uh, God uses a variety of witnesses to attest to what he is doing in the redemptive history. So, I mean, it's kind of like saying if Isaiah wrote, why did Jeremiah write? I mean, especially since some of their lives uh, apparently overlap, for example, with some of the prophets. 
so I mean, I think we understand that Mul- multiple witnesses to this to this truth are, are a good thing, not not a bad thing. And so there's the the other reason is that uh, each person is different. Even though the scripture says that the Holy Spirit carries men along, it's a navigational term, a nautical term. Nonetheless, they still are who they are. And the way we know this is, for example, when you read Mark, Mark's grammar is pretty bad in Greek. But nonetheless, what he's saying is true. But when you read Luke, Luke's grammar is amazing. He writes in classical Greek in his prologue. And so God uses divinely differences in people's training and background, even as they write what is infallible and errant because the Spirit of God superintends over it. So that would be an answer of why they're writing because – they they give different sides. It's kind of like why are there four gospels? It's different. It's it's, a, it's like a diamond, and you, you put it in light in different ways. You get different aspects of its radiant beauty. Same thing between Paul and James and Peter. Now, what was the other question you had? I'm sorry. I there's a few questions in there. I don't want to miss any. Okay. Basically, I was just saying like if you had it to where they actually it was an agreement between James and James and Paul, that he would go to the Gentiles and that James and Peter would continue to deal with the circumcision who were the Jews, then how is it that Paul's authority is for the Jews as well as the Gentiles when the agreement had been made in Acts that he would be going to the Gentiles? Uh, And that was the reason why I asked, well, what is the point of James and Peter even writing to the Israelites if – you know, if, right. if, well, if I mean, Paul had become the complete authority over that, it, it doesn't seem like they, they dismissed the law the same way that you see with Paul dismissing the law to an extent. Who right. am I supposed so, to believe um, as a believer? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. But and when I'm reading the Bible, that seems a little confusing as to who I should lean on in that regard. Like, well, should I be listening to Peter or should I be listening to James? Should I be listening to Paul? Uh, when it clearly seems that they made an agreement of who I should be listening to, depending on if I'm a Jew or if I'm a Gentile. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not sure if you're saying this, but if you are, I don't, of course, agree with the idea that there's any disagreement in what they're saying. So I don't, since since the Holy Spirit is superintending all the revelation, uh, we don't have a problem with contradiction. But I mean, th- these categories you're trying to draw aren't really hard and fast in Scripture. For example, who does Peter go to in Acts 10. He goes to Cornelius. In fact, uh, and even before that, you have Philip going to the Ethiopian. So you see missionary activity to Gentiles even before uh, Paul is very active on the scene. And what's Paul's habit? What's does it say his habit was to go, as you read the book of Acts, as he goes into each major city or even some of the smaller places, it's to go into the, the synagogue there. And what he does is he argues from the scripture, the Bible says reasoning from the scripture, that Jesus is the Christ. And so he, it, it, he didn't neglect. It's just a specialization, probably because of his background of where he was at Tarsus and because of his teacher, Gamaliel. There's certain things that the Lord had prepared him to do, but it's not as if Peter never speaks to Gentiles. Even in Acts chapter 2, he speaks to proselytes. He speaks to people from all nations. And what, does, what, what happens when they say, how must we be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. So, I mean, I, th- I think the message is congruent, and you can see that by Peter recognizing he made an error when Paul confronts him to his face in Galatians chapter 2. All right, we got to move on to the next caller, but before we do that, uh, Ron Devon Prosper, can you think you want to make a comment real quick before we move on to the next caller? Go ahead, you can do that. Comment. All right, so let's go to the next caller. Uh, again, that number is 319-527-6239. Let's go to 336-617. Uh, You're live on the air. 336-617. Go ahead. Hey, how you doing? Hey, what's going on? Uh, my name is Ben Yahweh, and I was calling to ask a question for both uh, partic- uh, participants. Um, my question is, what is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, if it is one? And please use scripture, not your personal opinion. All right, let's start with Ron, uh, Devon Prospect. Go ahead. All right, so um, in regards to the quote-unquote Old Covenant, and I don't call it the New Covenant. People call it the New Covenant. I call it a renewed covenant. So the quote-unquote Old Covenant, most people say it starts with Moshe or Moses, and that being the Mosaic Law, but I beg to differ. And I have a question that I'm going to ask um, vocab later on, so I don't really want to spoil it. But the uh, quote-unquote Old Covenant was 
given to the children of Israel. Children of Israel was given an unconditional covenant that the Most High himself was going to see through to the end that's everlasting, um, even if there's only a remnant to be the recipients of it, that was initiated by Moshe being the mediator between the Most High and being the children of Israel. So the purpose of that was to, number one, set them apart, make them Kodesh or distinct from any other nation that's around them. Number two, these things that were given to them, and particularly the statutes and ordinance, was designed to establish them as a nation of people. A nation operates based on several sectors of society, so they need to know how to deal with each other economically, how to deal with each other politically, socially, uh, in regards to health. If somebody had um, a particular disease or something like that, how would they be looked at in quarantine, etc.? So all of these things was initiated, and we go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31 and 32, all the way to 33, all the way to the end of 34, we see the situation where the Most High is giving this information to Moshe in order to give to the children of Israel. So the Ten Commandments is the foundational piece in which everything else springs out of. And we see that that was placed inside the mercy seat, and that was to show the foundation in which the Most High's throne has been established and how his foot stood the earth also has to object to that. Now, when we talk about the quote-unquote new covenant, which I call the Hadashah, the Brit Hadashah, a renewed covenant, this is anything that is brand new at all. Pretty much, number one, this actual plan was something that was already here before the scene opened up, all right? It was already written in the script before it was performed. And number two, we'll see that this renewed covenant is tied to the order of Melchizedek that we see from Hebrews chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. So this renewed covenant has to do with a covenant of a priesthood that had to be restored because a previous priesthood would pass on or be paused until the end times are to arrive when that uh, Levitical priesthood would again come to the forefront. But in the interim, the Melchizedek order is a contingency plan or a contingency priesthood to regalvanize the children of Israel who are scattered to the four corners of the earth, prepare them for the kingdom of Shammai'im or Elohim that is to come, and number three, go through various rites of passage and have an instructions on how to live, how to live out Torah in everyday life, so that way they may be without spot, they may be without blemish, and that they will be distinct from all the other nations around them in Babylon, so when the Most High comes back after reigning judgment, he will be able to receive them unto himself. All right, Vocab, you can answer. You can respond. Yeah, these are great questions. So uh, two things. One is I want to go to Luke chapter 22 and look at verse 20. And Jesus says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And the Greek, the Greek there is he kane diatheke. So it actually says new. Like the, he, he uses the, a Greek word for new, kene. And so I don't know why we would say renewed because he doesn't say this is the renewed covenant in my blood. He says this is the new covenant in my blood. And not only that, you have evidence for this even going back to Jeremiah because when you look at Jeremiah 31, the Hebrew, a lot of translations don't, don't uh, portray this accurately in the English, and it's fine what they do, but it could be more accurate. It literally means cut. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will cut. The Hebrew word there literally means a new covenant with the house of Israel. Again, that word cut has special significance. So this is not, this is not renewing something. This is something that is new. That's why it's getting cut. It's a new covenant getting cut. And so I don't understand why we'd want to say it's a renewed covenant or anything like that. I mean, that's the point, you know, in the beginning, uh, Divine Prospect asked me about progressive covenantalism. The whole point of that is the backbone of the narrative of Scripture are covenants. These are promises that God makes to people as history unfolds, and that's why they're progressive because they're taking place in time and space. The Davidic covenant is not identical to the Abrahamic covenant, but they, of course, don't contradict each other. And same thing with the new covenant and the old covenant. Good question. All right, hold on. Uh, three, three, six. Do you have a follow-up question? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, who would you say the covenant was for? Divine kind of already answered that. So this would be for vocab alone. And also, you quoted Acts uh, 2 and 38. Who is, who is Peter talking to in Acts 2 and 38? Would that not be Israelites? Because I don't see him talking to any Gentiles in that, in the, in that chapter. That's, that's all Israelites slash Israelites or Jews, however you want to look at it. Um, well, uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 11 says both Jews and proselytes. 
We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So he is speaking both to Jews and proselytes, because proselytes, by definition, are Gentiles. So he is speaking to a mixed multitude there in Acts chapter 2. Did you have another question? Um, actually, uh, we've got to move on, but Ron Devon Prospect, do you uh, want to respond to anything before you move on? Go ahead, you can respond. Um, were you, were you talking to me, Sal? Yeah, yeah. You want to respond to anything before we move on to the next question? Um, yeah, no, I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to respond per se, but what I will say is yeah. as we continue the dialogue, I will further elaborate on what I mean when I say renewed, because when I say renewed, I'm just going to say this briefly, it's because to the individuals who were receiving it, it seemed new. That's why it was presented as such. But when you look into the full concept of Scripture from a systematic theological perspective, you'll see that it was not nothing that was brand new. It was something that was restored because something was lost. All right, family. Once again, it's Debate Talk Be Radio. We have about like eight minutes more for this particular portion for the callers, but we're going to come back. We have some more time for the callers later on. You know, so if you missed your opportunity now, of course, we're going to come back later and get some more of your calls. So just stand by, but let's get some more callers right now. Let's go to 423-339. You're live on air. Yo, yo, yo. I got a uh, couple questions. What's up, Sal? Um, What's up? For, for one, I love the uh, Shield Squad. Is this, uh, is this with uh, G-Man and uh, So Real? Is that is that y'all squad? Is that y'all camp? Those are some of okay. our associates. Yeah, they're, they're in Shield Squad. Okay. I wanted to get a, a resource on how to get uh, some of y'all teachers. I only stumble, y'all, stumble on y'all on debate talk uh, for you. I didn't know if y'all had a channel or some uh, other avenues I could get some of y'all teaching. Yeah, so G-Man has probably got the biggest uh, subscriber base out of us all. And if you just, this is what he's titled it. He titled his channel and, and his uh, shows G-Man versus the Black Hebrew Israelites. So if you just look that up and under YouTube, just G-Man, uh, you'll be able to find him. And it was so real, he's easy to find on YouTube. You just have to hit two S's, so it's S S O R E A L. He's on YouTube as well, and he's got a ton of stuff. But S S O R E L, and then also at theshieldsquad.com, which is under construction, but there's a lot of videos that are already there, right on the front page at theshieldsquad.com. You can find a lot of videos. You can just click on them and, and, and go through a bunch of videos without searching through the internet as well. So those are some good ways. Oh yeah, and lastly, I'm sorry, Shield Squad Radio. We do a weekly broadcast. And sometimes uh, so real hosts uh, as well. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next caller. <clears throat> let's go to eight three two 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 eight. You live there? Hey, shalom, child. It's your boy James down here in Houston. Um, I just wanted to call in and uh, reemphasize a question that I heard earlier that I didn't really hear vocab respond to clearly. Um, the question about the emphasis that James, Peter, and some of the other apostles would put on the law, while Paul seems, from your interpretation, to put less emphasis on it. These other guys put more emphasis on it, and they dealt directly with the Jews. So we're wondering, do you think that the Jews are allowed to still keep the commandments of God and Gentiles are not supposed to? Is that how you view it? No, no, there's a lot more freedom in Christ. So um, it's under a somewhat different context, but in 1 Corinthians and a few places, especially 1 Corinthians 8, the Apostle Paul speaks about uh, the liberty that the believers have in Christ. And within that, there's a certain level of freedom in what is allowed. And so um, it is not a, it's not a sin, uh, to, for example, to, to keep feast days. It's not a sin to, to dress a certain way. None of that – that's, that's not a regulation against it, um, but and, – and, oh, and if a Gentile wants to do it, as long as a Gentile understands it's not the, the source of uh, their – not the source of thou, their salvation, you know, that, that it's okay for them as well too. Uh, in fact, I mean honestly, a lot of these messianic congregations that are Christian that, that I meet, I mean a lot of them are filled with, with Gentiles. Uh, every now and then you'll actually find uh, ethnic – Jews or whatever, and they they enjoy worshiping in that way, and that's definitely not a problem. I mean, I think that's in Colossians two sixteen. You know, 
Don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. And so it's, it's definitely not okay. The problem is if someone is trying to add it to the finished work of Christ, then Paul says if you're doing it that way, um, why don't you just go ahead and cut yourself off all the way in regards to circumcision, for example. He's saying if you're viewing this as meritorious law-keeping, just uh, cut yourself off entirely. And so he takes a real hard stance against those who add the law to the finished work of Christ. But no, it is definitely not something that's forbidden, and some people will find great expression in, in the gospel uh, through some of those things, and I applaud that. No, um, I, 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 I put special emphasis on the other apostles and not on Paul, like on James, on Peter, on John who seem to emphasize that we should keep the law. Like James says, this is the love of God. Besides that we still keep the commandments of God. But you seem to want to use Paul to make it as if we're not supposed to keep it. Guys, two minutes left. Guys, two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, as if we're not supposed to keep the commandments of God, but you say Paul is expressing this to the Gentiles. But we know that the other apostles are strictly speaking well, from your interpretation to the Jews, correct? And they're telling them to keep no. the law. Well, I I don't think like for, with Peter, we know he spoke to Gentiles. So in Acts chapter two, he spoke to Gentiles. Um, we also see Peter speaking to Gentiles in Acts chapter ten. So we know Peter had interaction and dealings with with Gentiles, and of course he was there also in Galatia with the situation between him and Paul and the the men who came from James. So uh, we see. You know, Peter does – he is talking to Gentiles. Um, did James have much interaction with Gentiles? Historically and from what we can tell in the canon, it's a little less likely, but he was present and signed off on the Acts chapter 15 council. And part of that was them saying, in essence, Paul had not run in vain. And so they're co-signing what Paul is doing with the Gentiles in Acts chapter 15. So their ministry is not identical to his certainly, but – there's overlap. Paul still spoke to Jews, and we see direct interaction with Peter and Gentiles, and James signs off because he was the leader of the Jerusalem Council. All right, let me, Ron. Let me, let me show you. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm done. I'm done. I won't take any more time. Go ahead, Ron. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah, it's all good. Um, so the brother was asking a very pertinent question in regards to um, who certain things were directed to. We know specifically – when uh, Peter is talking to what is deemed as an alophilos or somebody of another kind um, or of another kind uh, in Acts chapter 10, we know this is a special case scenario, right, because Peter is not giving this person everything that he was to teach to the circumcision. So when we follow up in Acts chapter 15, when a council is called, there are specific instructions that Peter gives to Shaul and his partner in regards to a particular individual that they should keep, which is similar to the Noahide laws. He does not tell them, hey, you guys got to keep the law. He says they should not have the burden that we have in order to bear the law, which means that he still spoke in the present tense in the sense that they were still keeping the law. So it was not his intention for these Gentiles to keep the law like they did because they are not of stock Israel blood, but there were certain general or moral parts of the law, like I was asking the brother earlier, that they were so expected to keep. And then when we open up the scene in Galatians chapter 2, we see exactly why Paul was writing to the audience he was writing to, because specifically he was following the instructions of the letter that was given to him to give to the audience that he started to write to at that time. All right, family, once again, it's Debate Talk. We're ready, y'all. And I appreciate the people out there that's uh, tuning in via phone or via Skype, but of course on social media, uh, checking out the show. I, you know, I see a lot of activity going on on social media. We appreciate the family out there. By the way, the chat room isn't working on Blog Talk Radio right now. However, if you want to email me your questions, you can, or you know, simply call in. But if you can't and the phone lines are full, uh, send me an email at debatetalkforyou at gmail.com. That's Debate Talk number four, letter U, at gmail.com. And I'll gladly read out your question. To the special guests, you know, I appreciate the family out there that's uh, tuning into the show. So now let's go back to the interview process of this particular program. Let's, once again, we're going to go back to the interview process. Uh, let me open up the phone lines. Again, it's going to be 15 minutes each. 
Let me open up the phone lines and the vocab. You can uh, ask your questions. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I think everybody's doing a fantastic job so far, and I greatly appreciate it. Um, since we were kind of on some of these issues that deal with, um, you know, the law and to a certain extent salvation, uh, I'd like to ask some questions about salvation in this spot right here. Um, firstly, though, getting back to Revelation, and this will relate to, the, to under, me understanding where you're coming from. Divine Prospect, what do you think is the, what you might call the big idea of the Bible? Like if you had a short summary… I know you couldn't cover everything, but what do you think is a big idea? Like almost like what's the main point of the Bible? If you had to whittle it down to one, what's something you might say? Uh, I would say it has to do with uh, covenants. Okay. Um, that's a great answer. Um, could you specify a little bit more? Like maybe I could – let me ask this question. Um, what ultimately, when it's all said and done, let's put it that way, would these covenants, in their final state, what be what would be their intended purpose? The intended purpose would be a consummation where individuals get to enjoy the presence of Yah like he intended in the beginning of creation. Uh, so, man, I'm – uh, so those two answers, uh, like in all sincerity, I love uh, those two answers. I can't think of any way – I mean, maybe you answered better than I could. Um, what do you think, in relationship to this, the big idea of the Bible, what do you think of these two passages? I'm going to go to Luke chapter 24. These aren't, like, tricky or anything. I just want a general idea of what you think they mean. Um, first in verse 27 of Luke chapter 24, and, you know, the context is the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And um, let me actually read 25 and 26, 27 to give you a little more context. And he, meaning Christ, said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now I'm going to go to verse 47 as well, and I'm going to start back at 44 and read this as well, because this is when he appears to his disciples later on. He says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Like, just what's your general this, – this is not – again, this is not a trick. I'm, what's your general, like, uh, understanding of the – of what that means, especially maybe in relationship to how we should interpret scripture? Like, how do you take those scriptures um, – like if you had a one-minute, two-minute teaching on him, what would you say? Okay. So in regards to his audience, so in, in common rules of hermeneutics, one dictates to identify the uh, author or the one speaking and the audience and the context in which things are being said. So at this point, Yahusha is speaking to his disciples. And in speaking to his disciples, he's speaking to them privately, right, because we see a situation after the resurrection and everything like that, where he goes and he deals with them only personally. So in speaking with them, he told them previously, before we get to this point, hey, don't tell nobody that I'm telling you that I'm about to suffer and die. He says that to them specifically. Don't tell nobody this, right? So now he gets to a situation where now he opens up to them after things are being uh, consummated, and he's saying to them, listen, at this time, all those things that I was telling you, you guys did not realize it until right now. Why? Because my purpose for being sent was because Israel, who you guys are a part of, had fallen away from its glory that the Most High has given them. So in doing so, the life that I'm living, the things that I'm teaching you, is expounding on the law, is expounding on the prophets, and everything is pointing to me where in this appointed time, I'm here to regalvanize the children of Israel back unto the Most High Yah and preserve them via the Ruach HaKodesh so that way the Most High can come back and receive them as his bride by virtue of the Davidic king uh, that's coming uh, in the end times. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, going over to a salvation-related issue, um, how would you define the gospel? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> One of my questions is going to be similar to you. 
But in regard to the um, euangelion or the gospel, which we say, or glad tidings, however you want to phrase it, uh, there are the, the gospel that's being preached is one about the kingdom of Elohim and the kingdom of Shamayim, heaven and earth, uh, or, or the kingdom of the Most High that's making its way back here to the planet. The reason for this, we see it in the Tanakh through the, the Nebaim or the prophets, was because the children of Israel had went astray. They had went out to other gods, other deities, doing customs that was detestable to the Most High. And because they did so, the Most High said, because my covenant is an everlasting covenant with Israel, I'm going to still redeem a remnant from Israel. So this gospel that was given was to be preached out to the remnant that if they were to take heed to what the prophets have said, then the Most High will reward them and their descendants in the end times. So now when the scene opens up with Yahusha, all he's doing is reverberating the same thing that the other uh, Nevi'im were speaking, most notably the ones he, he actually quoted from, Yimriyahu, uh, Jeremiah, and Yeshayahu, which is Isaiah. So all he was doing was coming on the scene and he was just speaking to them and saying, now the appointed time is coming where the gospel is going out of the kingdom of Yah. It's soon to come, soon to be on earth, soon to rule and reign amongst you guys. So now I'm here to get you in order to teach you how to live righteously according to the standard the Most High set okay. initially with Israel that they veered off. What yeah. would be maybe the best uh, passage from the New Covenant that you think the gospel is defined in? Maybe you like one good passage in the New Covenant where it's defined. Where it's properly defined? Um, that is a good question. Um, what I would say is I will go to Hebrews uh, chapter 1 And um, Hebrews chapter 1 We read at verse 1 It says Elohim after he spoke long ago To the fathers and the Nevi'im In many portions and in many ways In these last days Has spoken to us in his son Whom he appointed heir of all things Through whom also he made the age Not world That's a mistranslation And he is the radiance of his glory And the exact representation of his nature And upholds all things by his power When he had made purification of sins, hamatao, things that are, that are going to the wayside, he sat down at the hand of majesty on high as a bailiff, okay, to a judge, a magistrate, having become as much better than the angels as he inherited a more excellent name than they. And as we continue to read out to verse 14, it says, are they not ministering spirits, talking about all the other angels or melakim, the other spirits in which are messengers, he says, sent out to render service for the sake of, of those who will inherit salvation. What's the salvation? The salvation is now that Yahushua came to complete that which he was sent to do. His objective is to now purify those who are the called remnant so that they may be brought unto him and preserved or have an insurance policy. So as things come upon the earth, the trials and tribulations, that the testimony they have of Yahushua's teaching, which he expounded on the law, and he told them practically how to live it out, that they will be preserved because now Yahushua is in a position where he can enact this preservation and protection and also give its presence by way of the Ruach to the children of Israel. Right. Uh, let me say something uh, to the audience. So he said it's a mistranslation to say a uh, world there. But if you look, for example, on a more substantial lexicon, so like the theological uh, word book of the New Testament, for example, there's other places you can find this. Uh, one of the meanings of this word aeon uh, can uh, mean age, certainly, but it also can mean world because the way it works is uh, it works as time or course of the world, which goes into world itself. And, and a great example of this is Mark 4.19, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. So the word is aeon there, so the cares of this age, and so you can see how that really means world. Same thing with um, Matthew 13.22. And the reason why they do that there in Hebrews 1.2 is because if you compare some of the rabbinic examples, now it's in the Hebrew understanding of it, but if you look at it, there's the same sense even in the Hebrew word there. And even in the Apocrypha, Tobit 13.17 has a similar uh, example that you should translate it as. So I know what you're saying, but just be, I, I just want everyone to not too quickly, immediately, uh, just because someone casts doubt on a translation, doesn't mean translations are perfect or right, but we, we should look deeper into this and see, well, is there a good reason why they did translate it that way? So I just wanted to do Ab, that. Ask your questions, vocab. This is a questionnaire. Well, Please ask your questions. Well, 
Yeah, but I mean, it's it's going to work where if there's a, a, a something like that needs to be corrected, I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm able to say something now. Yeah. Here, here oh, is we can question. make corrections. I didn't, I didn't know if we could make corrections, but yeah, it's okay, an interview go ahead. process. Yeah, it's an interview process. Well, so. Actually, it's an aside. Interview. I mean, I I felt I felt like you did the same thing to me once, but okay. Do you believe the gospel is the power of God for salvation? Uh, yes. Okay, what do you think we need to be saved from or delivered from? Uh, we need to be saved and delivered from the things that are not the standard of Yah, as is first meted out in the Torah, and then it is it is actually enhanced or it is elaborated when we read the rest of the prophets and then with Yahusha. Things that are not the standard of Yah. What happens if we violate things? Uh, what if we uh, live or do things that are not the standard of Yah? What what happens to us? Uh, there's going to be a certain ignition that's going to come from Yah against all those who are turning away from his word and from his voice. So there's going to be damnation for those and condemnation for those individuals that are turning away from the standard of Yah. But do you do you agree that everyone falls short of the standard of Yah? Uh, to some extent, yes. What, what, could, what do you mean by to some extent? Because um, why are you qualifying it that way? Because there are, there are certain people who are privy on what the standard is and others who are not. And the ones who are privy who strive to keep it, they are in the process of perfection as stated by Yahusha in the book of Matthew. Uh, do you believe that you can cease from sinning uh, even while walking on earth before death? Is this a possibility? Uh, repeat your question one more time. Do you believe that you could walk in a standard of perfection while on this earth before dying? Uh, I think that is a possibility according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. All right. What do you think um, Scripture means when it says there is none righteous, no, not one? All right. So this is an appeal to authority because we're going back into the book of, uh, of the epistle no, 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 of no. Paul. It no, is. no, we're, no, we're not. No, no. Let me tell you where we're going. Let me actually tell you where we're going then. Um, it's it's from the old. That's from the old covenant Scriptures. And if you give me a second, I'll give you the – the actual the place it is that Paul is quoting the old covenant there. Yeah, that's that's um, Tehillim fifty three and three. That's Psalm fifty three and three. Yes, but you're yeah, speaking so about. Yeah, so I don't know why you. Oh. I don't know why you said Paul because this is from this is, for example, Psalm fifty three three. They have all fallen away together. They have become corrupt. There's none who does good, not even one. So I don't know why you said it was going to Paul. Paul's quoting the Old Testament. Uh, it's quick. It's odd to me how you quickly reject Paul, and maybe you didn't realize he's quoting the, the old covenant there. But what do you do with no, Psalm fifty-three? Because if you read, if you read Psalm fifty-three within context, verse one says, "The fool has said in his heart, there is no Elohim. They are corrupt and have committed abominable injustice. There is no one who does good. Elohim has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see that there is any there is anyone who understands who seeks after Yah." And then he says, every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. No, not even one. Okay, okay so what do you do with Psalm, Psalm, oh, 50, Psalm 51 then, which says uh, that he was David was born in iniquity? Yeah, well, that, that is taken out of context because – you're linking it to original sin. I don't subscribe to original sin. I don't subscribe no, no, to that. No, no, no. Chief, don't. I appreciate the way you've been answering these questions, but this is unfair when you're telling me what I'm doing with the question. I'm just asking you to interpret Psalm 51 5. What does it mean? Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. What does that mean? Okay, so it's Ben, Be'awan, Ho, Let, Let, Ti, U, Be'hit, Ye, Matni, Imi. So when we look at that, he says, Behold, in iniquity. What is a wan? A one is a type of sin, right, a going astray, or a guilt punishment, a punishment for something you've done that's guilty. He says, I was shaped in sin and conceived in my mother. So he's saying that as he came out of the womb, because he was born in a world that was already fallen, he was shaped by that worldview. He didn't come out of his mother's womb being in sin. He was shaped by the world he was raised in, the environment he was exposed to. So, again, like I okay. said, I don't subscribe to the doctrine of the original sin, because if I did, I, did. I would interpret him being born okay. with a sin nature, and I don't subscribe to that. Right. Well, I mean, I get the sense of that interpretation drawing the bullseye around the arrow. Well, let's go to Isaiah 64.6, 6, 
where it says that all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy rag. And you know that's a, you know what that is, that polluted garment. How do you interpret that then? Is that just the fool again? All of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment? How do you well, you got to look at the context in which that's being said in Isaiah. He's speaking to an Israel who is falling. They're not in their prime state, which they once were. So because of such, all those he is talking to, his audience, they have all fallen away from Yah, hence why the judgments are coming upon the nation of Israel at that time. to show uh, what we believe is true. Again, that number to call in is 319-527-6229. And now listen to two, Bait Talk Be Radio. And again, for those that are new to the show, this show will be on YouTube in the podcast section. Of course, we're on Blog Talk Radio. And of course, on the YouTube page, everything's Debate Talk for you. I see the emails, family. I see the emails. I appreciate y'all. And of course, I'm going to read them out later on. Some of your questions that you have for Ron Devon Prospect and for Vocab Malone. But let's continue this interview process. Let's go back. And open up the phone lines for 15 minutes. You can go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Ron. You can ask your questions. Oh, my bad. I was muted. Um, yeah, I was going to say I appreciate your decorum vocab, and I'm glad you're, you're still in there in the kitchen, even though it's getting hot. You know, and uh, this is my me being passionate, so don't take anything personal, okay? Oh, yeah. I appreciate it too, man. All right, so just just buckle down and let's get through the rest of this. All right, so the next thing I want to ask is, how can you verify the authenticity of Paul's apostleship according to the prerequisites laid out in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 um, and on? And if he was designated to the uncircumcision, which we see in the book of Galatians, then his epistles have no authority over the circumcision, correct? No, no, I don't agree. Yeah, I don't agree with the last part, so the, the simple answer is uh, they have binding authority over all God's people. And, okay, so the authenticity of his apostleship. When you read Acts chapter 1, verse 21, we see a situation where Judas is no longer with them, and they're having a discussion uh, to try and figure out who is going to be the successor of mm-hmm. Judas. And in doing so, they lay out the prerequisites. Did Paul meet these prerequisites, yes or no? Um, well, he did see the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 8, but no, he was not with them from the beginning. Did he witness the death of, of who you call Christ? Who I call Christ? <laughs> the, uh, he, um, I don't think so. Pretty, I, no, that, no I'm hist- saying, did he witness the death? Yes. Did he witness there's the death? No historic, there's no historical indication that he did. I have no reason to believe that Paul saw Jesus die. So he didn't see him physically. He was not a witness of the resurrection because we see who Yahusha appears to, and it's not Paul. Um, he had to be there with them from the beginning of John's baptism, which we see no Paul nowhere in the picture because we know Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, so Luke would have wrote about that, um, and we don't see that anywhere. So, therefore, he didn't meet any of those qualifications, and when they drew lots as a means of fulfilling a slot for apostleship, no lots was drawn with Paul. Why do you think that... Uh, the testimony that we get in regards to Paul is very subjective from his epistles and also from the writings of his traveling companion, Luke, who even the church fathers say was a Gentile who was also a physician, who was a traveling companion of Paul, and more than likely did not witness these events firsthand. Um, Well, Luke says he interviewed eyewitnesses, of course, in the beginning, which is a common thing that historians uh, of the day would do. And Luke has more detailed historical information, actually, than really Matthew, Mark, or John. So there's nothing substandard about Luke. And, of course, Luke also wrote Acts, which is odd. You kind of said this thing about Luke, but when you go to Acts, who Luke is the author of, to get these requirements, well, we have to ask ourselves a question. Are these prescriptive requirements or descriptive requirements? In the sense of we see what they're doing. But this doesn't necessarily mean this is what they had to do or some kind of binding way. They made a wise decision that was a good decision, but it doesn't mean that there couldn't come something that was in God's plan because this is not some kind of authoritative thing. And in fact, in the very same book, Paul's apostolic authority is recognized. In fact, the whole end of the book really is all about Paul's ministry throughout, I mean, his three missionary journeys throughout the whole known world. 
Well, let me ask you a question, Vocab. How come I'm hearing you speak more about Paul than you are Yahusha? Because I'm counting the amount of times you're mentioning his name as opposed to Yahusha. Well, uh, what did Paul determine to know? He determined to know the, uh, the cross of Christ and Christ crucified. So if I am speaking about what Paul is saying, I'm speaking about someone who is speaking about Jesus Christ. And here, here's the reason why. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts are historical documents, so they, they simply, by and large, uh, show events happening, and there are theological asides where the divine interpretation is given to the events in numerous places, of course, but it's actions, it's sayings, it's words. The epistles, including James and Hebrews and the others, are an occasion to explain what God has done in history, and so it's, oh, it's not a oh, problem… Hold on. So you do you prefer to get the best view of your interpretation of the new covenant through the lens of the thirteen epistles of Paul as opposed to these other texts that you just mentioned that's also in the New Testament? Well, I don't I don't set them in contradistinction to each other, but by sheer fact of volume or weight, since Paul has thirteen epistles and there's only twenty seven books out of the New Covenant documents, um that's you know, just do the math on that. So it, I, I've mentioned Jesus talking about the new covenant. Uh, I mentioned. That was it. We, I think so, we got. It's okay. Let's, no, no, let's it was not. That, I don't mean to correct. cut you short. That's, that's incorrect. But go ahead. That's okay. I didn't mean to cut you short. I just want to get through these questions for my second, my second segment. So, um, how would you exegete Isaiah 24 and 5 with particular emphasis on the words "everlasting covenant"? So you have to wait on me to turn there. Yeah, no. um, yeah well, it's, it's interesting. Um, the question is, what's the uh, covenant that we're talking about here? That's what's interesting. And it could be the Noahic covenant, for example. We're not entirely no, wait, sure you, what covenant. Yeah, it's yeah not enti- what, what covenant is are it? Are you saying no- that's about the Noahic covenant? Well, I'm saying it's a perhaps. What is the covenant? No, no, so read it, read it for context. That. Go up to verse 1. Just You can look it over for context. Sure. You want me to read it? Behold, the um, Lord will empty the yourself earth. And then just give me your um, you expounding on it. Yeah, behold, uh, well, I mean, I'm not sure if you're saying to, to read it, the whole thing or, or not. But I'm saying that whatever it is, it's not a problem because the covenants are continuous. They don't contradict each other. So they build upon each other. So the new covenant is not something opposite of whatever covenant is being mentioned here. If it's Noah's covenant, if it's David's covenant, which is everlasting, uh, whatever covenant is, all mankind will be blessed by it, and the new covenant doesn't contradict it. It just builds upon it. That's what I mean. That's why I believe in what's called progressive covenantalism. The covenants so are do you progressive. Believe, hold on. So, do you, so you believe that covenants can overlap each other or that all the covenants are consummated with the new covenant? Ah, so that's a that's a great question, and um, that's why at one point I asked you what you thought about Christ on the road to Emmaus at the end of the book of Luke, because what it shows is all Scripture points ultimately to Christ. All 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 the Scriptures have in Him their yes and amen. He he fulfills he fills up the full meaning of everything in Scripture from Leviticus Wait. to every other book. Gotcha. So are you saying, so my question is, do the covenants overlap each other and continue on? Do they run parallel or do they all consummate in who you call Christ? That's my question. Well, they, yeah, the, the, they find their consummation in Christ. Uh, there's times of overlap, though. For example, John the Baptist, when he's running around preaching, that's an, a time of overlap between the, the Old Covenant and New Covenant. And Apollos in Acts 18, 24 through 28 is a perfect example because he did not yet know the full information about Christ, although he was preaching Christ and defeating rabbis in the synagogue. He, he still did so not know about So when did that overlap cease, the, the Mosaic Covenant? When did that overlap cease? When Christ died on the cross? Well, that's when he says it is finished. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's that's when he says it is finished. And so... So is that uh, yes, or fin- no? yes or no? Yeah, there's a there, there's a finality okay. there, but there's working out in time. That's where the classic phrase comes from. Already, not, not yet. All right, gotcha. All right, let me move forward. Thank you. Uh, did Abraham keep the Torah 
i.e., the statute law and the commandments of the Most High? And if so, who taught it to him? Okay, so it, 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 if you're saying, you said Torah, i.e., statutes and commandments of the Most High. So I'm not understanding if you mean the first five books of Moses or if you mean some other kind of rules and regulation in relationship no, to Abraham. No, I'm not Abraham. talking about the first five books. I'm talking about a codified system of laws. Did he okay. keep statutes, the laws, and commandments of the Most High? Did Abraham keep the Torah in regards to instruction? Did he keep them in his time? Uh. No, he sinned. He lied, for example. He was, a, he was a sinner. He lied. He did not keep it. So uh, when you say he lied, you're saying that that is something that the uh, Torah speaks against? Thou shalt not lie, yes. No, it says bear false witness. So that means if an act was committed and you was called before a judge in order for you to testify on what occurred, that is where it says do not bear false witness. So that's why Abraham was excused for his little life because there was a greater purpose for him doing that. But let's go to Bereshit chapter 26, verse 5. It says, Ekeb Esher Sama Abraham Bepoli, Why ye smart, mis marti, mis wotai, huk hote, we tog rokta. That means, and because that Abraham, he obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commands, my statutes, and my laws. And it says, and this is the Most High speaking to Isaac, his son, and he's speaking on testimony for Abraham. Abraham was initiated into a particular system of obedience. Why? Because after we see that Melchizedek came, guess what happened? After he was blessed of Baruch by Melchizedek, then the Most High said, Halak, walk uprightly before me. Then the Most High said, then now you can circumcise yourself. Then the Most High said, give me a sacrifice. Then the Most High said, now later on I'm going to fulfill this promise I'm giving to you as a son. So before these things occurred, he had to be initiated by Melchizedek, and we see that going into the book of Hebrews. So moving over to my next question, which is not really a follow-up, but can you please explain to us your position regarding the covenant of works, the covenant of grace, and the covenant of redemption according to your progressive covenantalism disposition? I want to know, do you subscribe to these things? Why not? You could just be very brief. Well, I mean, uh, Abraham, you know, he believed in the Lord, and that's why he was counted as righteous, not for any works, because this was done before circumcision, which is the very argument that Paul makes. When you talk about covenant of works, covenant of grace, um, I think it's better to break it down into the six major covenants, the one with creation, the one with Noah, the one with Abraham, the one with, at Sinai, the one with David, and then the new covenant. That's, that would be a preferred overall uh, scheme as far as the major covenants. I don't the, – the covenant of works is a little more Presbyterian in my view. So you don't subscribe to the covenant of works doctrine? Uh, it, well, it depends how it's defined, but it's, uh, it's not – All right. So, it's not so, exact- so here's an example. So regards to, to Adam and regards mm-hmm. to the covenant of works, do you agree that something was given to him as far as a command that he had to keep and that he failed to keep that command? Did that initiate a covenant of works, something that he had to do in order for the Most High to continuously keep him in the state that the Most High intended for him to be? Well, he certainly was given commands – by God, and he certainly violated them. Yes. So you do subscribe to the covenant of works. What about the covenant of grace and the covenant of redemption? Well, so those aren't, I mean, these terms are, are, you know, invented. They're trying to describe something. But when you say, I like, it was helpful when you asked me about Adam specifically. So in relationship to covenant of grace, what specifically, I'm trying to understand what specifically you want me to answer. Okay, I'm going to move forward. The reason why I ask this is because if you're familiar with New Covenant theology and progressive covenantalism, you'll know specifically what I mean when I say covenant of, of works, covenant of grace, and covenant of redemption. But we're going to move forward. I'll leave that for the audience to research. Cause I have a couple more questions. i only got a few more minutes, all right? So the question is this. If all the covenants are fulfilled through Christ, why did the apostles still adhere to elements of the Mosaic law, which is one of the covenants, such as keeping the feast days, uh, we hear uh, Peter talking about, you know, the uh, dietary law, at, um, uh, certain uh, uh, things in regards to him talking about, well, we can't put on the Gentiles what we are here to bear. Why is there still an overlap after Yahushua has passed with not only the apostles but also Shaul, who's keeping the Sabbath, and who wants to be in Jerusalem for these feast days, 
Why did this not cease? Why are they still keeping this if all they're following is the law of Christ? That doesn't sound like just love to me. I mean, I would just like to know. Yeah, they, so they, they, they lived their whole life as faithful Israelites, uh, as far as attempting to be faithful Israelites, obviously sinners like the rest. Um, and there's, there's no demand that the minute they understand, believe, and accept Christ for who he is, that they have to stop all those things. And I mentioned that earlier. Well, that, means that, um, that means that it was okay for them to accept Yahusha and still keep the law. Oh, certainly, and I answered that earlier. The diff- the All right, now, with that you- being said, hold on, I got one last, I got, I got a few seconds. Okay. If that's the case, okay. do you call the Essenes and the Nazarenes of the early 1st to 4th century, would you call them heretics because they also did the same thing? Uh, well, the Essenes and Nazarenes are not identical. Uh, the Essenes are extremely oh, no, problematic. No, that, I'm, with sorry, they- I'm sorry, I meant the Ebionites and the Nazarenes. My, my apologies. Oh. Well, the Ebionites have problems in their Christology, and they have uh, challenges there that make them outside of orthodoxy. And the Nazarenes, some of these groups we don't really know a ton about, so uh, a lot of what we know is speculation. But by and no, large, well, not, it's not really speculation per se. We actually have the church fathers actually document from what they knew at their time, which would be closer than us, yes. on how they lived. And one of the main things was they kept the law, but they also subscribed to Yahusha. Now, they maybe had some differences with those church fathers in regards to Christology, like you said, but if they're keeping the law and they subscribe to Yahusha, and you said the apostles were doing the same thing and there was no error in that, then... All right, once again, family, that number to call in is 319-527-6239. We're going back to the callers. We're going back to the callers. And, again, I appreciate the family out there that's tuning in via phone, via Skype, via social media, checking out the show. And I got a lot of emails, so I'm going to read some of the emails out. Again, it's going to be 20 minutes for the callers right now. Then we're going to go back to the interview process after that. But uh, let's go to the callers. Let's go to 678-437. You're live in the air. Hello, six seven eight. Hey, what's going on? How you doing? Hey, shalom, shalom. Uh, this case is shalom, uh, divine process. How you doing, brother? Uh, I got a question for y'all. This is for this is for both of you guys. What's the difference between uh, the moral law and the law of Christ? All right. I guess we can start off with Ron. You can answer. Yeah, Ron. I, I didn't. I didn't uh, understand the question. Can uh, Can you repeat it again, um, Aki? Yeah, no problem. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. I said, uh, what's the difference between uh, the moral law and the law of Christ? What's the difference between the moral law and the law of Christ? Well, when people say the law of Christ, I don't subscribe to the doctrine of what's called the law of Christ. Um, when Yahusha was here, all he was doing was expounding. Uh, and given insight into the Torah that he was living himself. So anybody that uses that term, law of Christ, I would would hold in in high scrutiny to define what that is, which was unfortunately undefined earlier when I asked the question. Um, But when we talk about the moral law, the moral law is something that is universal, uh, that we see was an expectation from the Most High from the beginning all the way into this present time. So uh, very simply, the moral law which we see in Torah and then repeated by Yahusha is do unto others as you will have them do unto you. And these things will fulfill most of the law because when we look at the law, the Most High gives us instructions on how we are to honor him, but most of the instructions are given to how we honor our fellow man. And everything is being able to do something for somebody else that we would want them to do for us. So most of the Mosaic law is founded on moral law that was already preeminent and universal, and we see this law spread out after Noah and his sons perish. They then pass whatever knowledge that they had after the flood to their descendants and to their kin. So there was always a moral universal law. We also seen that Noah, uh, he gave a sacrifice. You know, we see that Noah, he separated the clean from unclean. Uh, we see there were certain things that Noah did that he had to have been instructed on how to do these things because there was already an existing moral law in place, which the Most High demanded of his creation in order to keep. So the moral law never went away with. The moral law is still here, but... 
in order to fully understand the moral law, we have to read the text from the beginning to the end, not the end to the beginning. And in doing so, we can fully see through the lens of Torah, looking all the way to the end of what people call the Bible, we fully understand what moral law is and how even the those who are not Israelites, Romans chapter 2, last couple of verses, Paul says to those who are uncircumcised, if they keep the law like the circumcised, will they not be considered righteous? Yes, because that is a universal moral law that all mankind has, and we even have the sages who, who has written rabbinical works on the uh, Torah and Tanakh. They call it the Noahide laws. Those are always universal, and we even see three of those seven Noahide laws picked up in Acts chapter 15 when it's being disseminated from Peter and James uh, and to uh, Paul and all the other people at the council at Jerusalem. All right, let's go to vocab. Vocab, you can uh, answer. Matt, Matthew twenty-two forty, um, Christ says, On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. What are they? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That one's foundational. So it starts vertical before it gets horizontal. We always got to stay God-centered when we speak about this. It's the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, uh, Paul even breaks it down further in Romans 13, 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. That's my answer. All right, due to time constraints, we've got to move on to the next question. And if, but meanwhile, let me squeeze in an email question right now, and I appreciate the people that's emailing me. Uh, once again, we appreciate it. It's debatetalkview at gmail.com. That's debatetalk, the number four, and the letter U at gmail.com. This question is from Eric. I appreciate you. This one is for vocab. It says, wouldn't the original Nazarenes be the best example of how we are to live as followers of the Messiah? Uh, I wish I could talk to this person, I guess they're, if, if, if they mean Nazarenes as in some later on uh, group that, again, we don't know a lot about other than what some people wrote about them, um, it's hard to say because we don't really know exactly. Now, if you mean sort of the slur term of the sect of the Nazarenes that is given to Christianity in the book of Acts, then yes, these followers of the Nazarene way, the sect of the Nazarene, uh, Christians, um, that's, that's what's going on, Acts 24-5. I mean, modern-day Christians are supposed to be, I'm not saying they always are, a continuation of what is laid out there in the New Covenant documents. Um, but if we're talking about the, the Nazarenes along with what was mentioned earlier, the Ebionites, the information on them is simply not adequate enough to draw any final conclusions. They did not leave behind a large body of writing. We mainly know what people said about them. And it's not uh, a mistake that many of the early Christians disagree with key tenets of their beliefs. So it's inconclusive, ultimately, in my judgment, if he means the sense of that Nazarene group along with the Ebionites. All right. Uh, Ron Devon Prospect, I have an email question for you as well from Eric. Uh, it says, is so-called black people recognition to our indigenous culture as Hebrews in opposition to the good news of the kingdom? Explain why or why not. Say that one more time, Sal. Is so-called black people reconnecting to our indigenous culture as Hebrews huh? in opposition uh -huh. to the good news of the kingdom? Explain why or why not. No, it, is actually, it actually enhances the gospel. Why? Because if we are identifying so-called black people as the quote-unquote Hebrews or uh, more commonly Israelites, it is their obligation to be a beacon of light unto the nations and to get this message out in order to regather the scattered tribes of Israel. And if there are wandering Gentiles or strangers who want to cleave unto that, we have the standard of righteousness. We see that in Romans chapter 3. I'm going to use Paul uh, because of my, my, uh, my associate on the phone. And Paul says, what, what, what? benefit is it for you to be called a Yahudim or part of the Jews? He said, much way in every soul that they were given the very oracles of Yah. We are the vessel of the oracle of the Most High here in the end times in the earth. Being that 
so-called black people are one group of many people, but very peculiar people who have been downtrodden, who have been enslaved, who have been ostracized, who have been oppressed, who have been suppressed, for the Most High to raise them up to speak the gospel message as it was purely intended to go through the blood Israelites unto the nations, them doing so only enhances the gospel because the message was given first to the oppressed and to the poor. And the oppressed and the poor we see statistically here in America with the so-called blacks. So waking them up is only waking them up to their identity to obligate them to bring this gospel to the four corners of the earth to reach their brethren first. And if any Gentiles from wandering Gentiles, and I say wandering specifically, Gentiles from other nations wants to cleave unto this, then they can subjugate themselves to those who the Most High call to lead and be the beacon of light here in these end times and in this earth. Hello? Yeah, I'm on the on the phone. I don't know what's uh Oh Sal, you there? Oh, what's going on? Well, uh <laughs> Okay. Wow. Okay. What do you propose? Um, um what do you propose? We can't take any more yeah. questions, I guess. Yeah, I know we can't um, because he he controls the line. Um well, I'm, I, I guess oh. we're just going to have to wait for him to come on. I'm going to send him a message. See if you can send him a message, too. Um, he might have his phone muted. Sal, if you muted, unmute your phone. Um, somebody, if y'all can call him. I can't call him, but if somebody can call him or text him, tell him we can't hear him anymore. Well, uh, what do you say if we just go back and forth asking each other questions or do open dialogue? Because, I mean, I don't yeah, know what yeah, else we, we can really do. We can freestyle it till he comes back. I don't have a problem with that. And then when he comes, we'll just, just I guess, uh, yeah, switch it back. Um, yeah, we'll go back to the just, audience. That's where they was at. Yeah, something you just said. You said uh, Gentiles can subjugate themselves to those the Most High called. I assume you mean uh, Israel. What do you mean um, Gentiles will need to subjugate themselves to Israelites? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so when I say Gentiles, I'm speaking – uh, from a Tanakh perspective, as strangers, those who are not bloodline Israelites, the preferred order uh, was that if the stranger wanted to cleave unto the Most High, uh, they would have to be within the sovereign nation of Israel, and they would have to be a citizen of Israel and keep the statute laws and commandments. Um, and in doing so, they would have what's called a native-born status, but the obligation is given to those who are bloodline Israel to actually be the arbitrators in regards to righteousness because the covenant was initially made with them and their forefathers. That's what I meant by that. So uh, like an application of that, do you All right, hold believe on, Hold on, hold on, I'm back. Block Talk Radio actually uh, mouthed me out the show. Up. <laughs> but I'm back right. here. I'm back. Can you hear me? Loud and quick. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, All right. Sir. Yeah. Once again, I apologize. Block Talk Radio sometimes acts up. Uh, let's go to the next caller, though. Let's go to the next caller. Let's go to three four seven nine six eight. You live there? Yo, how y'all doing? Can y'all hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. That, that. Okay. Um, yeah, I really would like to them to finish the little discourse they had while you was um, interrupted briefly. But um, this is my question um, in regards to the authority and apostleship of Paul. Uh, like you guys brought up a few moments ago in Acts chapter 1, I think it is, verse 20 on down, <clears throat> it gives the parameters for apostleship and how it's fulfilled and how it was a fulfillment of the prophecy of Psalm and let one take up his bishopric. So it was inspired by the Most High in that whole instance where they had to take up another, one who was a witness of all the ministry of Christ. Okay. And, um, uh, like I said, the question in regard to his authority. In First Corinthians chapter eight, Paul gives a discourse on his position on how we should look at eating things, sacrifice to idols, frequent temples of idol worship. Right. And then in Revelation chapter two, we have in the letter to the churches, Christ expounding on among the believers, some had adopted a doctrine which he called the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam 
to teach the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and how that was a uh, deal breaker, I guess. And if we had that doctrine, we could not enter into that salvation. How can Paul be an apostle if he's teaching us to eat things sacrificed to idols? And specifically, how to hide it from believers who didn't believe that? And that question would be foremost to uh, Brother Vocab and uh, Brother uh, Ron, if you want to respond on it as well. All right, there, Vocab, you okay. can answer. Uh, so looking at this initially, I think there's uh, the, the context probably. Uh, there's, there's two things going on. Uh, what did Balaam actually do? He taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they, who's they? the sons of Israel might eat food, sacrifice idols, and practice sexual morality. So it's going back. To, it's actually saying what Balaam did there, like what, what was done by these false prophets to Israel back then. So the point is leading them astray. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam. Uh, but I think the key really, though, is the Kai, eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. It's the joining of those two things together in a lot of these cultic ritual sacrifices that is really the problem, uh, not uh, simply eating the food sacrifice to idol alone. That would be my take on it initially. All right, there, Ron. There, Ron, you can answer. Um, I think I understood the question correctly in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Um, so when we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, uh, Paul opens up and says, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known what he ought to know. And we go to verse 4, it says, Therefore concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, but there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called powers, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, he's recognizing this, Yet for us there is but one power, one Abba, for whom all things exist, etc. So what we have to understand is that the audience, the, the people of Corinth, when we see where the people of Corinth was at, there were fools that they were even unto sacrifice, I mean, uh, that was sacrificed unto idols. And we see this is something that also is in the uh, Tanakh as well. Um, and this is even why we see the Nazarenes uh, later on cease to eat meat because they believed that all meat that was in the marketplace was polluted by people who were either Hellenized or by the Gentiles themselves. So he's speaking to people who have familiarity with these practices, right? And he's saying to them, listen, if you guys are going to come under the wing of what we're teaching, and again, Paul, like, like uh, uh, Vocab Malone says, was still keeping the law, Paul understood that there was some, this was something that they were not to do. So this is very distinct because even whoever these individuals are that are there in the in the uh, uh, the ecclesia, not church, of Corinth, they understood certain things that pertained to the law. So he's saying that we all have this knowledge, meaning that the audience in which he is speaking to, the direct audience, there were individuals there who maybe shared it with other people or people may have gotten contact with other Israelites, but they were aware that this was wrong. So he had to go in and speak more of. He says eat food as if it were sacrificed to the idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to Elohim. We are neither the worse if we do not eat meat, nor the better if we do eat meat. Now, he goes on to speak the rest of it, talking about the liberty that you have should not put somebody else in bondage. Again, the audience in which he is talking to are people who are either fallen from Torah or people who are not aware of Torah, but they know consciously that eating meat especially those sacrificing the idols, is wrong, and all he was trying to do was set order in regards to the ecclesia in that region. All right, family, once again, uh, we're taking some of your calls right now. Right about now you have maybe five minutes left uh, for the callers, but, uh, you know, i add maybe one more minute or two. But uh, let's go to the next call. Let's go to 206-240. You're live on the air. 206-240. Hey, okay. So I got a real quick question, and uh, it's for vocab. Uh, Divine can answer it, too, if he wants to. Um, it's the uh, book of John, chapter 11. I'm going to start at verse 49. It says, But one of them, Cephas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, 
not that the whole nation should perish. It says, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but also to gather in one the children of God that are scattered abroad. So my question is, where it says he prophesied that Jesus would die for that nation, I want you to tell me who that nation is, and I want you to tell me who are the children of God that were scattered abroad. Uh, yeah, so Caiaphas pronouncing this does certainly anticipate Jesus' substitutionary atonement. Um, and there's like a double meaning there. John does that a lot. There's other places in his gospel where he does that. Um, but Caiaphas, the high priest, is, is not going to give a proper understanding or definition of the gospel. Remember, he's, he's part uh, of the people who are, who are wanting to kill Christ. So him, him saying that uh, is not definitional to what the gospel is. And if you, if you think about what he's trying to say, he's saying, look, the Romans are going to come. They're going to take us away if this gets out of hand because of what this guy is saying, and we've got to protect that. So it's okay to sacrifice him to protect that. So if you look at it, going back to verse 48, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come in the way and take away brother place and our nation. It shows that he didn't have any type of salvific understanding there in place. But John sees the deeper meaning in what he's saying, which John does that a lot, like I said, double meaning. So Caiaphas' uh, pronouncement there is not definitional to what the gospel is. But the ultimate answer is that who does Christ for, die for? He dies for the elect. Who are the elect? They're compared to Jew and Gentile alike, Romans 1.16. Okay. Um, so what I would say, that's very interesting that Volcab would say that no salvic knowledge, uh, which we will call soteriology, right? So soteriology has to do with the doctrine of salvation and being saved. For him to say uh, that <laughs> the Pharisees and them would have no knowledge of that. I didn't that, say that. That's not what I said. I'm speaking of verse so 48 what did you say? specifically. Verse, 40, so what did you verse, say? 48, verse 48 specifically, I'm saying uh, what Caiaphas is saying there, his consideration is in verse 48. So what, what are you I'm saying, saying as far as the salvic understanding of the Pharisees? Uh, what did you say in regards uh, to that? No, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't say anything about the Pharisees. I said Caiaphas. I'm saying that Caiaphas' consideration is not salvific. So what, what was Romans Caiaphas? Was he a Pharisee? Uh, yeah, well, I think – I don't know if Caiaphas was a Pharisee or Sadzi, actually, off the top of my head. But uh, but the Pharisees – I mean, Jesus was closely more closely aligned to Pharisees than he was Sadducees. I don't, I don't diss the Pharisees. Uh, with a broad brush. I mean, Nicodemus is a Pharisee, and he, he understood the concept of born again, I believe, by the end of John chapter 3. Exactly. So in order for, yes. So when we talk, about, when we talk about salvation, right, and we're talking about forms of, of part of salvation would be Yachanan chapter 3. And while Yahusha is speaking to Nicodemus, he told him about being born again, about seeing the kingdom of Elohim, and he's talking about the spirit gives birth to spirit. And he says, you should not be surprised at my saying you should be born again. In verse 9, he says, how can this be? He says in verse 10, you are Israel's teacher and do not understand these things. So part of salvation has to do with being born again. The expectation is that the Pharisees should understand what salvation is. The problem was yeah. because they were, not all of them, but some of them, were in a position of prominence, that they were creating other little rules and guidelines that led other people astray according to the worldview of the writers of the New Testament. This is what kept them from actually teaching it in its purity. So Yahusha came just to set things in order in that sense. So when that text talks about suffice it for him to die, All right, my apologies, fellas. My apologies. Time ran out. <laughs> Time ran out. We got to go into the last process, but, and then uh, we're going to take some more callers after that. But I appreciate the family out there. There's a lot of activity going on. Of course, I'm going to try to get to some more of your email questions, and uh, I see you hit me up on social media as well. <laughs> There's a lot of activity happening. I'm uh, multitasking at this point. But uh, let's go back to the interview, the interview process. All right, one two three one nine five two seven six two three nine. Let's open up both. Our special guest phone lines and let us begin. Interview. Right on. Yeah. Matthew Matthew chapter twenty eight, there at the end, uh Christ's command is to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Matthew twenty eight, eighteen through twenty. Do you at Kingdom Harbinger practice this, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit to all nations? No. Why not? 
um, because from my research, and um, I'll tag you so you can see all of it, uh, we believe this was an addendum to the text. Can, is there a textual resource? Is there a textual critic that agrees with this? Yes, there is. And if you give me a second, I could pull it up for you and give you the reference if you like. All right, yeah, I'd like to look into that because the ending of Mark is problematic. The ending of Matthew is not problematic in this way. Let's go on to another question related to actual practice. We're getting down to the nitty-gritty. Do you celebrate or observe communion? Not mass, communion. Do I celebrate communion? I can celebrate communion with Passover. Uh, do you take this cup in remembrance of him, the covenant, the cup which is the covenant of his new blood? And do you, do you is that something that is part of your liturgy? Um, I wouldn't say it's liturgy per se, but it is a uh, culmination of both the Passover um, and uh, Yahusha when he took it during Passover. So it's to remi for us to remember the work that he's performed for the nation of Israel as well as what Yah performed for the nation of Israel by way of Moshe. Yeah, because uh, it says this cup is a new covenant. My blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. All right. Um, in relationship, continue on uh, things ab about Christ and what he taught and who he was. Do you believe that Jesus Christ bodily, physically rose from the dead? Um, I would say I'm neutral on that. Um, you're you're not certain if he was physically raised. What would be the other yeah, options in your mind? I have an agnostic position on that. Um, what do you do with uh, the fact that part of what a person must believe to be saved is that God raised Christ from the dead? Uh, Paul said, like he said, according to his gospel. So we see the emphasis really placed on Paul pushing this to uh, his audience, which would be the Gentiles, as opposed to something we see that slightly different in regards to what the apostles okay. preached to the circumstances. So, what about the end of the book of John, where he says, uh, if you want to, Thomas, you can put your fingers in these holes now. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you believe that that was bodily or not? How could Thomas put his fingers in holes that were not part of a body? How would that be? Yeah, so in regards to that part of the text, uh, that's what the literature reads. That's why I said that's one of the pieces of evidence that I weigh in favor. But I also look at historical accounts from other sects that do not subscribe to that. More notably, the one that I mentioned earlier, which is the Ebionites, who believed in what's called a spiritual resurrection. Right. And that's why I'd had a, that's one of the reasons I have a problem with them. Uh, John 20, Christ says this, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, brother, I encourage you to see and believe. Uh, or, I mean, I encourage you to believe, although you have not seen, so that you can be blessed. Now, in relation to Christ, <laughs> okay. what do you I'm, I'm what do you mean when you say that Jesus is the avatar of Yah? What do you mean by that for the people to understand? What does it mean to say you, Christ is the avatar of Yah? You said I said I said Christ was the avatar of Yah. I said that. Yes. When did you I said I, that did numerous that? numerous times in in your discussion with uh, Israel doctrine on Hinoth. Uh, I was talking about Yah being the avatar for uh, El Elyon. Um, and that was talking about the uh, the divine council. So I don't I don't oh, if I oh if so I, you weren't saying Jesus. Okay, I must have misunderstood. Oh, okay. I was saying that Yodhe Wafe okay. was avatar for El Elyon, and I explained why that was my position. If you'd like me to expound on that, I have no problem doing so. No, I'm glad I asked because I misunderstood. I thought you were saying Jesus was avatar. Thank you. I I understand. That's why we're doing this to to better mm -hmm. understand. Okay. Oh. Um, well, a couple of questions about the divine council and henotheism. You told Israel doctrine that we need to we need to know the assignments uh, of these of these evil gods or evil powers so we can better prepare to uh, fight their attacks. How mm -hmm. would you say one goes about learning their assignments? What's the epistemological process there? Okay, so epistemology is how do you define what is known, what you know. So we'd have to look yeah, at the scriptures like, for one example of that would be Judges knowing, yeah. eleven. And in Judges chapter 11, we see a situation where Japheth was speaking to the king of Ammon. And in speaking to the king of Ammon, they had a very interesting discussion where uh, you see Japheth is saying specifically, he said that, did not your power, Molech, give you what? The land that was allotted to you. So the land that you have is yours. 
but our power has given us the lands around you. So that means that we know that there's a power that can designate land to a people that he has a covenant with. So in order to understand who these entities are in regards to the divine council, we have to first look to see various names that's used throughout the text that we use and go to comparative texts as well, which one similar would be the text of Ugarik, right? Ugarik will let us know a lot of things that was going on in the land and the understanding of the Canaanites in the land before Israel went and possessed the okay, land. Through comparative, so the purpose of understanding I, these, okay, the purpose of understanding who these powers are, and it was, it was, it's a reconstructive process, is so okay. that we can know what powers are over which trades, which peoples, what yes. lands, what okay. areas, etc. So a quick answer is, is is via comparative literature through the ancient Near East. Okay, I understand. Uh, you mentioned Molech just now. Now that's interesting because earlier in the discussion you said you could not objectively say that it was wrong at the time for the worshippers of Molech of other nations to do things such as present children as sacrifices to Molech. But then later on in the discussion you talked about the Israelites got entangled with, quote, customs that were detestable to the Most High, end quote. And you talked about how the prophets would come correct them. This was in relationship to the question I asked you, please define the gospel. Now, here's the question. If these customs, such as child sacrifice to Molech, are detestable to the Most High, are they not objectively detestable, or is it just he doesn't like them? Because once you say they're detestable to the Most High, that means they're objectively wrong. So I'm, I'm sensing – a contradiction. Are they detestable to the Most High? If they are, they're objectively wrong. How could they not be objectively wrong if they're detestable to God, who is the standard of holiness? I don't understand those two things that you said. Please help me understand. All right, cool. So if, you go, if people go back and listen, I also say it's a neutral position because I said it cannot be objective because we're looking at the literature from the lens of one culture and how they view another culture. The Israelites were penalized if they adopted the culture, customs, and practices of nations who Yah did not enter covenant with. So he had to give them things that were distinct to set them apart from the other nations so that way when the other nations see Israel, they know whose power they are. So I'm saying in regards to child sacrifice, the way that it was being offered from those children unto Molech, the Most High did not want the Israelites to offer children to the god Molech because Molech was not the god that had a covenant with Israel. Now, did the Most High Yah require child sacrifice as well? Yes, he did. In certain cases, he required child sacrifice. I did a whole entire lecture on it that I would encourage you to go back and watch called Capital Punishment, and it says the uh, human sacrifice for the atonement of sins in the Bible. So we got to look at it from the right. cultural perspective of who's writing the literature and who's the one saying what's right and what's wrong. So if people come under the God of Israel, quote, whole God of Israel, and they're following this literature, then anything that we see in the literature that deems it to be ra or evil or wrong, then they should sway away from it. But if they are not cleaving unto the God of Israel, then they're going to adhere to the customs, practice, and tradition that they are being told is right or what is wrong. Thank you. Um, a well-known Hebrew Israelite um, said this. This is a quote. The scriptures say, prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of the fathers. So because of the crimes that the forefathers committed against us is why I want them white babies to die, end quote. Do you agree that that's a proper application of that scripture? Um, I'm not going to say that's a proper application of that scripture because the text does not say white babies. It's interesting that you're not telling me who quoted this, which I, I believe is very I'll, unfair. I'll tell, you. Um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Okay, okay. It's Captain Tazariak. And all right, there we go. It's, I knew you was going to throw that monkey at some point. So let me expound it's, on that. So when the well, text let me tell everyone where it's from. Real quick, let me give the source. I, you're right. I was going to give the source. That was step two of the question. Uh, it's in the dialogue with a young man from West Africa. I believe he's uh, Nigerian and Ghana, and I think San Eder is there, if, I'm not, if my memory serves correct, and uh, he won't let him into the barbecue. He says, no African, no Asian, no Chinese, no white man, no German, no Russian, no Caucasian, no non-Israelite will ever eat with me at anything the ISPUK is having. And at the end of it, he says, so because of the crimes that the forefathers committed against us is why I want them white babies to die. So you don't agree that's the proper application of that scripture in Isaiah? Yeah, so what I'm saying is let's go to a scripture that actually speaks about this, which is Tehillim 137, 8 to 9. It says, O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one. How blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense with which you have repaid us. It says, how blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. This is 
uh, a psalmist saying this, more, more notably, Dawid. What is he saying? He's saying that when we understand Psalm chapter 83, which talks about the alliance of the nations that are coming together to make war against the children of Israel, whoever those nations are and whoever is cleaved unto those nations who are punishing the Most High Israel, pillaging the Most High Israel, oppressing the Most High Israel, then the psalmist is saying, happy is the ones who will be destroyed because Yah is the one that is fulfilling this vengeance against those who are purposely uh, 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 right. perpetuating acts against them. So we identify that people are from these nations, and they're unrepentant, and they are party to individuals or entities or institutions that are doing this to the nation of Israel, then yes, at some point when the Most High recompenses his vengeance across the nations for what they're doing to Israel, that is one of the things that will occur. So I'm not going to say it's white babies so, per se, because the text is not explicit with white babies, but we're looking at tribes and nations. It's different. I don't see it okay. in that sense. So hopefully that, okay. that explains what my position yes. is on that. Thank you. Um, I heard one time when you were on Debate Talk for You, you advocated the biblical uh, support for polygyny. You didn't say that everyone needed to do it or anything like that, and you said there were certain uh, parameters which should be in place before someone – uh, does polygyny, which is uh, a man having more than one wife. Uh, what do you think is the best passage in Scripture that teaches polygyny is a holy way to practice marriage? What would be like the, the best text that would show that? Well, the best text for me would be anything that is in uh, Deuteronomy that has to do with equity, right, and fairness. So if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 15, it says, if a man has two wives and he loves one, but not the other, and both bear him sons, but the first is the son of the wife he does not love, then it shall be in the day he wills what he has to his sons. He cannot make the son of the love the firstborn before the son of the unloved who is the firstborn. So when we look at these regulations in regards to uh, polygynous uh, relationships or marriages, we see that there is a protocol that must be followed, and the premise of that is loving equally. Okay, for a man to hate one wife and love the other, we have a situation with Rachel and Leah. Right. Can one I was, uh, ask one a was hated. We have a situ- huh? Right. Are there any examples you could think of in Scripture where both wives were loved equally? Uh, well, the sex says that Solomon loved his wives so much he gave them everything that they wanted, even his concubines. So you think That's he loved a man all that a had thousand? Both of the wives. You think he loved and, all and, a thousand? And, and, yeah. What I'm saying is, had a multitude of wives. Just like Dawid as well, David. They had a multitude of wives, and they treated them as fairly as they knew how to. So that okay. that is one example. Show love for their wives, even until their own destruction. You mentioned in the – well, that doesn't seem like a good example, but I understand what you're saying there. Um, you mentioned in that same show that there needs to be sort of almost like – self-governing bodies to regulate that this to make sure this is done obviously yeah. you know in current united states law it couldn't happen because you know it's not allowed and by the way i'm not using the united states uh, law as as the the standard i'm just saying that's what's currently in place but within that do you think that you uh and maybe uh some other people at kingdom harbinger would be qualified to help regulate polyandry uh, i'm sorry poly- polygynous marriages do you think that that's something that you could be able to do yourself to help Okay, yeah, I, I would I would be more than happy to do that because that is a provision that is given in the text. It's not exclusive that that should be the way that everything is done, but it's a provision in the text. So it would be individuals who will understand protocol behind uh, how polygamy should be set up. Now, if you want to know further on that, I have a video that I can send you that I did on it, but I, I don't have the time to go into all the scriptures okay. to instruct polygyny and how it should be done righteously. But this act, matter of fact, Numa Yisrael, who was just uh, uh, doing a promo for Sal, I did a show with her, and you watched it, and you'll go, you'll you'll hear during that dialogue the various scriptures we referenced and the various things we talked okay. about, regards to how that should be regulated. So if anybody that's part of my organization wants Hold to on, be let's... part of to 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 regulating that, if the if the individuals who are practicing it allows mm-hmm. that, then yes, I don't see why that would be anything that is that is wrong. Okay, I only I mm-hmm. only got a second left here. Do you oh, sure, sure. think that the Ariyah's 12 tribes chart is right and exact? Uh, no. Why not? I don't, I don't subscribe to that.
Hawaii family, once again, I know you guys are enjoying this show. What do you believe? What do you believe? We started a you know, new format, you know, more interview process, and hopefully everybody's taking on their notes. And the show is archived, people. The show is archived. So, again, you know, you can uh, check out the show later on in the archives. But let's get back to the interview. All right, so let me open up the phone lines. And, Ron, you can go ahead. All right, let's go. All right, so here's my question, Okay. Uh, what was the method of soteriology geared towards the Gentiles in the Old Testament? Can you explain that to us? Abraham believed that it was counted righteousness, Genesis 15, 6. So you're telling me that if any Gentile existed in uh, the nation of Israel, all they had to do was believe and they are counted righteous? What what did they have to believe? Uh Verse 6 of Genesis 15, which Abraham is a Gentile there, of course. He's from the Ur of Chaldeans, and he uh, believed the Lord, so he believed Yahweh, and he counted it to him as righteousness. All right, so let's look at Isaiah chapter 56. It says, this is what Yah says, maintain justice, do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the person who does this, the person who holds it fast, and who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it and keeps their hands from doing evil. Let no foreigner who is bound to Yah say, Yah will surely exclude me from his people, and let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. But this is what Yah says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give within my walls and the temples a memorial and a name better than the sons of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to Yah to minister to him, to love the name and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Can you please show me where belief is in there so that they can be accounted of righteousness if the text is given instructions on what they're to hold fast to. Well, of course, that's not the only place that aspects of the uh, Old Covenant are laid out. I mean, circumcision of the heart is what's valued above all, and that's why Yahweh in later context would say things like, your feast days and all your sacrifices, it stinks in my nostrils, because it was not the mere outward keeping. And um, you even see times where, um, you know, like when David ate the showbread, where aspects of sort of the letter of the law could be violated for a larger purpose. But under the Old Covenant, the Sabbath was a covenant sign. It represented a lifestyle of devotion to the Lord, and it was essential for uh, the community to have. So the true people of God, that are, are they're going to inherit all of its promises. They've got to hold to whatever covenant stipulations are given at that time because okay, God so is in charge and, of his and covenant. And decides to keep the Sabbath today, would you say they're in error? Well, no one keeps the Sabbath, but but if, if I think if you're saying if they observe things on the day that is called Saturday, uh, no, they are not an error. I've said this a number of times. We don't judge people based upon days. Okay, so that means that I could keep the feast days and still be righteous, correct? Well, it wouldn't be adding to your righteousness. That If you think that, that's where you have a problem with the gospel because – if gotcha, you and I disagree. Your so is the Ten Commandments still in effect for New Covenant believers? If so, and this is an elaboration on the previous question, what's your take on Sabbath adherence? And why did Yahushua Shaw keep it? And it, and the reference for that is at Exodus chapter 31, verse 16. It's an everlasting covenant. Right, so that's out of the, uh, the Decalogue. That's the, I don't know, the most, I don't know what the word is, interesting one, I guess you could say. Um, you know, because it, it has a different type of thing going on because in the New Covenant, um, these things are written on the heart. But what would that mean for Sabbath keeping, right? Well, I think Hebrews 4, 9 is really the ultimate answer. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. And it goes on. And really – in the New Covenant, Christ is our Sabbath rest. So resting in the finished work of Christ is the answer of how a New Covenant believer has that law written on their heart. But when you, still say, a, Christ, when you say Christ is our rest, are you referring to Hebrews chapter 4? Well, that's, that's, I just read Hebrews 4, uh, 9 through 10, for example. Yeah, yeah, I just, wanna, I just want to make sure that that's, that's where you're, you mean as far as your foundation on that perspective. 
Well, I would I would juxtapose it with Hebrews ten, which shows uh-huh. um which which shows like this continual cycle of sacrifices and all these other things that are done away with now. Okay, so so the Ten Commandments are still in effect. Do you agree the Ten Commandments are still in effect today, even for New Covenant believers? Well, it uh, it always goes against the holiness of God to murder. It always goes against the holiness of God to to lie, and that's why we have the fruit of the Spirit against such things. There is no law, and is that so yes or uh, no? these things are. Well, these things are written on the heart of the believers, and we have to continually every day put on Christ. Even so the Sabbath, because Christ if, on the Sabbath, Saul kept the Sabbath, and Paul said in First Corinthians chapter eleven and one, "Follow me as I follow Christ." So I'm asking, if we're keeping the Ten Commandments, and the Sabbath is one adherence that is everlasting, should all believers, even New Covenant believers, should they keep the Sabbath today along with the nine other commandments? If you're saying that this is standard protocol for believers, well. I, what I was getting at with the beginning of the question was how uh, the New Covenant understands ultimately uh, Old Covenant stipulations, and I was answering specifically in relationship to the Sabbath. And so you mentioned Paul and how he, he uh, you know, kept it, but, I mean, 14.5 is the answer to what he says about that. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced. In his own mind, the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. So there is the answer. There is freedom in Christ. And that's why I so care about with, Hebrew Israelites and their gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it so so offer with freedom. that being said, again, the audience he's speaking to are Gentiles. So it was not a requirement for them to keep the Sabbath, right? So if one person who did not just keep the Sabbath, because remember, the holy day they're referring to is the feast days as well. These feast days is an ethnic marker for those who have a covenant with Yah via the Mosaic law. So when he says no, nobody judge you in a feast day, they cannot force the feast day on somebody, which is also a Sabbath. They cannot force that on somebody if they, their ancestors did not come into direct covenant with Yah. So this leads me into a following question that, I'm, that I, I want to ask you in regards to that. Um, were Old Testament saints justified by the Mosaic law or by grace? Uh, they were justified by belief in the Lord, just like Abraham was in Genesis 15:6. That's a foundational text. Even Habakkuk says that the just shall live by faith. So, so they didn't have to keep the law. Uh, part of their expression of their faith under the old covenant was to please God, and the way God prescribed devotion was by feast days, Sabbath keeping, and exactly. things of that nature. And so, James said so the same certainly thing they as had well. to. Our works is yes, dead. Certainly, so, certainly but that being said, it, yes, certainly certainly requirement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you said it's by so you said by belief it was equivalent to belief or the mosaic law. How would they justify? You broke up. Uh could you repeat that? I did not hear what you said. Sure. I said when you said belief, is that equivalent along the lines of grace or is it by the mosaic law? How were they justified? Oh, we're always justified by grace. A great example is Israel pulled out, uh, you know, of, of Egypt. Israel did nothing to deserve God's deliverance. In fact, they weren't even given the covenant until afterwards. So the law mm-hmm. came after the grace had already been expressed to them via their deliverance. So we're always saved by grace. It's just the expression so even, is different. Even this chapter 16, where the fat Sabbath was first instituted before Exodus 20, they were given instructions the whole time. So it was one thing for them not to warrant the Most High redeeming them because of the covenant he made with their forefathers. But it's another thing that once he initiated that covenant, they were conditioned. Hence why there's a remnant and there wasn't a remnant. The ones who did not obey were destroyed, and their children, 20 and other, were preserved. And they had to also be circumcised, and then they were brought into the land. So even if you say in belief, I mean, belief is very general, it's very generic. But how do you validate a quote-unquote belief is through your works, through your acts. Yes. So following up with that, I would like to know, what is your eschatological worldview? Are you premillennial, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? I know uh, when it comes to progressive covenantalism, which is a subset of new covenant theology, uh, there are some things in dispensationalism that you'll grab from, some things from covenant theology that you'll grab from. Um, but I want to know, what is your worldview as far as a premillennial, a millennial or post millennial? Because from my perspective, you are a millennialist. Right. So uh, I historic. Uh, I don't. I don't consider um, 
progressive covenantalism as a subset of new covenant theology, but I understand what you're saying, and there's probably other people who would say something like that as well. Um, yes, Steve, the I lean person that historic, wrote that I mentioned earlier, I didn't even cut you off, but he actually says that it is a subset of new covenant theology in an interview that he was given, and you say you right, subscribe they, to that. And yeah, but in other interviews, they talk about why they don't use the term new covenant because it's so nebulous and has been abused by people who uh, kind of get antinomian on us. But I understand what you're saying. And, and, like, and I will call so, you an anti antinomial, but that's that's another thing. But go ahead, finish what you were saying. <laughs> oh, sticks and stones, sticks and stones. But not for real. So <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I would consider go myself ahead. historic, historic pre mill, but uh, I could be convinced of a mill. For sure. Like somebody could convince me of Amil. So I'm a historic pre mill, so I do not have a rapture. I don't have a secret rapture. I don't think the reason I don't have it, I don't think it's a biblical doctrine. The secret snapping do you believe away that, and all this. Do you do you believe that he's reigning today through his saints and that that reign is suppressing greater evil that could be arising right now until until we have a physical return or a judgment? Well, that what you just said is a strong argument against amillennialism, and that's why I still lean historic pre mill. I said someone could probably convince me of amill, but I'm not an amillennialist. I'm a historic pre mill, so I do so have a you, situation. Go ahead. Uh -huh. No, I'm sorry. I was going to ask you. So, do you do you subscribe to a tribulation period that's going to occur here on the earth? Yes, although the Left Behind movies do not present an accurate rendition of it, yeah, yeah. in my view. I got you. So but do yes. you believe that, that Christ is going to appear in the sky and he's going to – because you say you don't believe in a rapture, but do you no. believe when he returns it's going to be judgment against all nations? Do you believe when he returns it's going to um, uh, take – it's going to modify the world system? Like when he returns, what is he yes. going to do according to your worldview? Yeah, so uh, when Christ returns with his angels, with the saints, he enacts a final judgment. I believe he sets up, sets up a 1,000-year kingdom that is not identical to the final state, but nonetheless something I do think is outlined in the Bible. That's why I'm still pre-mill. I'm just not pre-trib pre pre-mill. Uh, I do believe he lays that out according to, I believe it's Revelation 20. But uh, Christ rules and reigns uh, uh, all peoples. In a situation that's unlike anything we've ever seen, and the main emphasis is that God will dwell with his people, and the people will dwell with God forever, and the, the heavenly city comes down. And it's very interesting. Before this, uh, God prepared a place. Then he put the people in it. Now he's preparing a people, and he's going to bring the place to the people. That's when the heavenly gotcha. city, or oh, as Galatians oh. calls it, the, the heavenly Jerusalem comes down. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, no problem. Um, so uh, I would say you're more of a futuristic premillennialist, so we'll, that's where we'll put you in based on what you're saying. So my, my next question would be, uh, do you believe that the Old Testament saints was added to the Ecclesia after Pentecost? Hold on, I don't think I understand this. The Old Testament saints were they added to the Ecclesia? Old Testament, uh, I mean in church, were they, uh, were they added to the church after Pentecost? Or before Pentecost, oh, well, what is your world view I mean, on that? The Ecclesia gathered in the wilderness. So you're saying that they were added to the body of Christ before the, the Pente before Pentecost came? Yeah, it, they look forward okay. to the promises that God is making. They look forward through their sacrifices. And All right, so do you, enacted, to the London yes. Baptist, do you hold to the London Baptist Confession of 1644? Yes or no? 1689 is the one I hold in my hands. So federalism. So you, you subscribe to that doctrine? I don't – you know what? I'll be honest. I don't fully understand the way they lay out federalism, so I cannot give you an honest answer. I'm still looking into what they mean by that. If you mean the federal headship of Adam – That's why I asked 1644, which comes before the 1688 um, and 89. So let, let me move forward. So um, my question is uh, – I'm trying to figure out which what last question I want to ask you since I got like a minute. Uh, so, do you do you subscribe to the tenets of Calvinism, i.e., tulip, right? Total depravity and conditional yep. election, the atonement. Okay, so you are are yep. you a hyper Calvinist or are you just a moderate Calvinist? Well, I, if I, I understand hyper Calvinist to be someone who doesn't really believe in evangelism. That's not me. I believe in evangelism. Gotcha. Okay, so do you believe in the doctrine of imputation of Christ's righteousness to believers? Do you subscribe to that? Yes, absolutely. Yes. 
And last question is, what's your position regarding the visible and invisible church? Is the church mixed or regenerate? And if so, how do we discern this? That's my last question. There are tares among the wheat, so they're all false believers. And sometimes we don't know until the very end, but sometimes, according to 1 John 2.19, they go out from among us because they show us they were never part of us in the first place. So there's no way that we can look at a person's works and tell whether or not that the Most High yeah. is that they're, they're, they're elected the Most High or not. Yes, there are ways. So the same letter, First John, gives several tests. They're doctrinal and moral tests, you could say, to kind of uh, test people's confession, if you want to put it that way. For example, do they love the brethren? Do they love the sisters? If they if they don't, they're liars. The truth of God is not in them. If they consistently so if you ask me for a loan and I charge interest, am I justified in doing that? Would that be okay? family once again i appreciate everybody that's been tuning in uh we still have a lot of callers standing by and uh or, you know a lot of activity going on on social media uh so this is the last portion uh for the callers and after that we're going to pretty much wrap it up again uh we assigned uh 20 minutes for the callers so let's go back to the phone lines family again that number is 319-527-6239 that's 319-527-6239 put it on speed down make sure you call in via phone or via skype you can call in let's go to the callers though Let's go to 973-810. You're live in the air. All right. 973-810. Can you hear me? All right. I guess we better move on to the next person. Uh, let's see. Let's go to... Hold on, hold on. Six one five six eight eight. You live on the air. Six one five six eight eight. Yeah, shalom, shalom. Shalom. Yeah, uh, can you can I be heard? You lied clear. You good? Good. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Um, this, I just wanted to, you know, send a shout out. This is Brother uh, Jason Ben Yadavas Ben Yashahala. Um, give a shout out to Brother Ron, of course. Divine Prospect, keep doing what you're doing, man. You're a big inspiration. Um, I want to give a shout out to you, Sal, um, for you know having a platform like this. For my question, um, I have a question for Brother uh, Divine as well as Brother Vocab. But if you know if you ain't got time, it's okay. My question for Brother Divine Prospect is. I see that he's not against the teachings of Paul, but at the same time, he doesn't hold to them as tenets of, I would say, scripture or doctrine. My question to him is, if he believes this, is there any example of the rest of the fellow companions of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, condemning or at least saying that there are things about Paul's teachings that are not quite right? And my question for vocab is, quite simply, who is the New Covenant for? According to Jeremiah thirty one thirty one. All right, excellent question. So, um, I am, and my position on Paul is I'm not saying I reject Paul's writings. What I'm saying is his writings are not authoritative to me, meaning that I'm not bound to everything that he is commanding individuals to do. Um, there is a lot of information in Paul's writings I glean from, and that is helpful, and some instruction that's also insightful. Um, but in regards to how the fellow apostles viewed him, from my perspective, looking at it objectively, they just allowed him to be around. You know what I'm saying? Like they saw that he was helpful in a particular area because he was being rejected from you know, the rest of the apostles. Um, and I think that we don't have any firsthand testimony aside from the doubtful Second Peter uh, which I'm not saying, just because it's doubtful, I'm not saying that it's not valid. I'm just saying it's doubtful, and I'm saying that for from a textual criticism perspective. Uh, but aside from that, we don't really have testimony of Jude talking about him, James talking about him. Uh, we don't really have a lot of testimonies of them actually speaking about him in depth. Um, and I think that's mostly because they were focusing on who their audience is. So I would say they tolerated him. I would say that he had a role to play, and he was an unofficial apostle. But I don't see him as an official apostle because he does not meet the prerequisites of Acts chapter 1. Now, with that being said, um, what I will say is that 
he still gave information that is still helpful to Israelites today uh, because a lot of things he was saying was information based on his worldview that if Israelites adhere to it today, it would empower them further in their walk. But I don't subscribe to the fact that people who subscribe to being Israelites today are bound by Paul's epistles as if it is Torah. Torah is the only thing that is that is binding with the provisions and modifications made to it over various covenants going forward afterwards. Um, but ultimately, I would say that Paul was tolerated, he was accepted, tolerated, and he was allowed to just go and speak to the Gentiles because they they saw he had he just filled the gap. So they allowed him, like I was saying, my New York verse, Adam the Rock. They said, oh, you can go ahead and rock, do your thing. And they let him do what he had to do, and that, and that, and, and it was beneficial to the people who he spoke to. So that's my position on that in regards to Paul. So again, I'm not against him, and I don't talk bad about Paul. I don't say we should throw his writings in the trash or burn it up. All I'm saying is, as an Israelite person, I identify as an Israelite. It is not binding to me as far as being authoritative on the same stage as the Torah. Yeah, you came a little broken up a little bit at the end, but uh, vocab. You remember the question that was asked? That you can answer. Yeah, who was the the covenant for, I believe, is is what he said. Um, well, it's a great question. So, of course, we see what it says is, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, will I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So no question about that, the original context of what it says. Um, a few things about that. One is, I think if you look at earlier passages in Jeremiah, it shows that there will be Gentiles or non-Jewish nations that will be established in the midst of Israel in this new restored people of God, they are also exiles who be, be brought home. And we know that at various points, Israel did have strangers in its midst. So even saying this, this means there's Gentiles included in this because there's Gentiles who are included in the house of Israel and the house of Judah. A great example of that is Caleb the Kenizzite, who later on is described as being part of the tribe of Judah. It seems a bit, in essence he was do- adopted in because we see from his father that he was not actually a Gentile. And, or I'm sorry, not actually an Israelite, but rather a Gentile. So there's, there's one aspect of it. Now, that's kind of the safe answer. I'm going to give the more controversial answer as well. Uh, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, they are redefined in New Covenant terms. And the main place I would go to that is Galatians 6.16, which I believe speaks about the people of God, the church, as the Israel of God. There's an equation uh, – there's an equivalency, I'm sorry, rather – they're given in Galatians 6.16. So there's a further redefinition about what this even means in the new covenant that is once it is actually given. All right, uh, Vocab, I've got a social media question for you. <laughs> straight, out of, say straight up on Facebook. Are you ready? Yes, sir. All right, it says, uh, Sal, please ask Vocab, if the apostles were not in error for keeping the law, as he stated, then what is his contention with those who choose to keep the law today? Uh, this whole notion that I've been hearing numerous times all night that people keep the law um, is not actually biblical. Nobody can or ever has, except for Christ, kept the law. Furthermore, what is the law? A schoolmaster, a tutor, shadow, not substance. It's These are the ways uh, the New Covenant scriptures describe what the law was for. So it is not something that it was ever given to save people by, quote, keeping it, because if you could be saved by keeping the law, then why would Christ come, which is the very argument, of course, of Galatians. And so law-keeping was never intended as a salvific device in the first place. All the aspects of the law point forward to Christ. He's the interpreted method by which we look back and understand what the law, what, what the Lord was trying to do with the law. So no one keeps the law. And Paul says if you, if you think circumcision, for example, which is a key part of the law, he says if, if you try to keep that but you break one part of the law, it doesn't even benefit you anyway. And then under the new covenant, that's why he's able to say it counts for nothing. It availeth nothing, the KJV says. So – under the new covenant, um, we have to say with we have we have to look at the cross of Christ and say it is finished. And so that's really I just think a proper understanding of shadow and substance according to the Book of Hebrews will be extremely helpful here because nobody keeps the law, nobody can even somebody says they're trying to has all these gaps in their ability to keep it. For example, if someone breaks the Sabbath, 
you don't you don't execute the judgments on them. So yet executing the judgments are part of law keeping under the old covenant. If you read it carefully, there's just manifold problems. It's almost like the Lord has taken away people's ability to even try to keep the law by saying, look instead to Christ. There is no temple. One who is greater than the temple is here. All right. We've got to go back to the phone line, take another question. Of course, we'll try to get as much email and social media questions as possible. Let's go to 509-263. You're live on the air. 509-263. Hey, Shalom. This question is for vocab, actually, and follow-up to the previous question um, about law-keeping, or I'm sorry, about keeping the commands, and you said that nobody has. So what do you think about in reference to Luke, the first chapter and the fifth verse, talking about the mother of John the Baptist and his father as well? Right. So there are times in Scripture, uh, say, for example, with the example of Job, where there will be a certain phrase employed, which I, if taken out of other other uh, you know, considerations of, of the whole of Scripture, a person could say, oh, look, they're keeping the law perfectly. Because uh, Job, I think, I think it, it calls him perfect or something along those lines. But there's manifold meanings to what those words can mean. And so nobody is keeping the law in its entirety and it's perfect. And that's why scriptures like Jeremiah come into play, which say the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. We violate the intent of the law in our hearts. And um, we go on and on and on. So there is no one who truly keeps the law. And again, if somebody could keep the law, then Christ wouldn't have needed to come because there would already be another avenue by which people could attain salvation. Um, you want to answer brother, can, we, can, we, can we deal with Luke 1 and 5 with the exact verbiage in that uh, text? Okay, Luke 1 and 5 says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. That's Luke 1 and 5. I think you mean Luke 1 and 6. It says they were both okay, righteous before apologies. God. Walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So, um, do you believe that um, Zechariah uh, kept the law perfectly? I'm, I'm actually looking forward to what you have to say about that. It's not a discussion about okay. my point well, of view. Well, we know he didn't. We know he didn't because in verse 19 he had disbelief, and Gabriel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring these good news. And behold, you will be silent. And they will speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words. So we see an example in the very passage of his disbelief of heart, doubt in the heart of the man. He, he was not perfect, and he doubted even there. It was judged by God via an angel in the very chapter you mentioned. Okay, so – All is, right. See my time. Yeah, yeah, you can can I add yeah, real quick um, mm-hmm. now? Good, good, good. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is so this is standard of righteousness uh, that was equated during that time, and that was the individuals that kept the law. We see that in Matthew chapter twenty-three, uh, verses one and two, it says, "Then Yahshua spoke to the crowds and disciples, saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moshe's seat. So practice and observe everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach." This is what Yahusha is saying. And we have a situation where Yahusha was a bit doubtful. He's a little shaky when he was in a garden of consent and he was praying to say, yo, can you let this cup pass from me? Hold on. You need to man up. What's the problem? You know what you're about to go through, so why are you getting weak? Now, because a person has a moment of weakness and that could be a, 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 a really room for doubt or uncertainty, does that make them unrighteous? No, that does not make them unrighteous because people are still human at the same time. So there's a level of righteousness that people are held to, but at the same time, they are still human. Being that they're still human, it's a process in which they have to get to know Yah, Yadah, get to know him personally. So what I would say is there was always a standard of righteousness. Yahushua said from his mouth that the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat and to practice and observe everything they tell you. So there was a standard of righteousness that was also co-signed by Yahusha, and the people who were keeping that were deemed righteous during that time if they kept themselves from the leaven of the Pharisees, which was uh, viewed by the New Testament authors as being hypocrisy. And again, this wasn't all the Pharisees, just the ones who were hypocritical based on their high position. 
family. The show is almost over. Uh, actually, you have nine minutes on the air. We're going to go into the overtime portion of the show, definitely. So what that means, if you're on social media, if you're on the Internet checking out the show, once that time runs out, the only way you get the rest of the show live is by calling in. Again, we're just going to take a few more callers and then get some last words from both special guests. If you want to catch the entire show live, the number is 319-527-6239. Uh, let's get some more of these callers. Um, matter of fact, let me go to social media real quick. I think I have a question for Ron. Yep, I have a question for you. Uh, it says, in Genesis 12, 1 verse 3, what work did Abraham do here? That's the question. The question was, in Genesis 12, what work did he do there? All right, hold on. Let's, let me get this. Genesis 12. Um... He's talking about when when Abraham was called from out his uh, home, the work that he did there was he obeyed, right? Shema means to hear with the intent to obey, right? The scripture says that obedience is better than sacrifice. So the work he performed was his obedience, and so not just believing that the Most High called him to do something, but he acted out on it, and he obeyed the command that was given to him. And upon obeying that, the Most High continuously dealt with Abraham. If he would have believed but did not act, then guess what? He would have not been party of anything that Yahweh initiated with him. So he had to carry something out in order for the promise of Yah to go forth in regards to Abraham. All right, let's go to the phone lines real quick. Uh, once again, they have like eight minutes in the air, so please call in if you want to rest of the show live. Again, that number, 319-527-6239. It's almost over, but uh, we're going to go to the overtime portion of the show, so make sure you call in and check it out. Let's go to 973-810. Still live in the air. 973-810. Can you hear me? Hello? All right, we got to move on to the next person. We got to move on. All right, let's go to 773-640. You're live there. 773-640. Yeah, you're live there. Yep, you're live. Hey, shalom, shalom. So, um, peace, peace to my brother, Ron Divine Prospect, and uh, peace to uh, Vocab Malone. This is Mikael Ben Israel calling out of Chicago. Well, Jericho, Hebrew, and the whole night. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm listening, and uh, you know, I want to uh, uh, say so it don't seem super biased. The whole breakdown that Ron Divine Prospect was given, because the title of this is "What Do You Believe?" So I'm not going to get off subject. It's "What Do You Believe?" And we deal with two different opposing beliefs or thought sets. You know. Um, and it's, and, and uh, my thing was, y'all was breaking down the thing about Paul. Paul has become like the issue that Ryan brought up. He didn't say that Paul was not a bona fide, you know, uh, you know, a soldier of God or whatever you want to call him. But certain things Paul admitted that he had served, you know. And now what we see is Paul has become the authority over Christ. And I think that's the point that he was trying to bring out, although it may not have been Paul's fault. So if you look at it, right, uh, is Paul Paul was never the Messiah. You know what I'm saying? And it's like you got these two views, and this leads to the – I'm going to um, run down a statement quick, and I'm going to ask uh, Bokeh Malone a question. If you don't mind. And the thing is, you have two opposing views. One is like Ryan represents the Christ of the Hebrew Israelites and uh, the Bible. And at the other hand, Vocab represents the Christ of our past when we got off the slave boat. That's exactly what he represents, everything about it. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's why it was a question that he refused. He refused to uh, answer when I asked him on your last show. So my thing was, one of the biggest things that, since we're dealing with beliefs, one of the biggest things that we're dealing with now to all of this and our audience, it is uh, the fact that Vocal Malone represents the Shield Squad, which represents uh, apologetics for Christianity. I mean, they defend Christianity. 
why is Ryan is coming as a man who woke up to know that he's an Israelite, but he still believes in the God of the Bible and he believes in Christ. So he's representing that. And the whole thing is, you know, um, the biggest thing that the Shield Squad said is that they have to learn a new way to counter the identity crisis of the African American church. So we don't know who we are. So their biggest goal is proving that we're not who we say we are when we wake up and say we're Israelites. It really doesn't have anything to do, do with doctrine. But being that this is the platform and that's the subject, I'm going to go ahead and deal with it. So I want to say this. Most of the time, they use NIV. Uh, uh, that's just yeah, that's why you know, that's why you know, I mean, Kai, I was kind of running out of time, so we get it to see a question, bro. Oh, here yeah. I come. Yeah. I got, hey, Sal, you know, I got you, man. Let me get this out, man. I'm talking. This is I, very you down. Oh. That's why you know, you down. That, that, I, I got you, bro. I got you, bro. Okay. Uh, uh, here's the thing. Information doesn't matter to this whole movement against the Hebrew Israelites. It doesn't. It's not about doctrine. It's not about none of that. And so I'm going to cut on to the meat since he said we got to run out. My question has been, like it was last time vocab was on, which version of Christianity or Christian believing in Christ, New Testament, the Holy Bible, is better for the African-American community? Is it is the version of the Protestants that you come from which actually was part of the racism, which I got said by a book called Pat- um, by Patrick Lewis Coney. I want everybody to check that out, where it breaks down it, so I could put him under that same category. So my question is, which version of the worship of uh, the, the Most High Christ is better for the black community? Is it the version that came from the slave master that ran through the Catholic Church and went to the Protestant Church, which you are open Protestant, if I'm not bearing false witness, that or is it the version that you see with the Israelites or the blacks that have waken up and say, we believe in Christ too, but his laws attached to it. I want you to answer that question because on the last show, you said you refused to answer that question. And, and that's my ending thing, but I want to say this to Ron. You got him, Ron. You got him when the fact is he don't know that the Torah or the laws are broken up in five parts, ceremonial law, sacrificial law, dietary law, moral law, and judgment law. You can say easy judgment law. Oh, let me, can I answer this question? This can has been a long... Go ahead. Hey, can we mute this guy? All right. So, uh, yeah. Ahead. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think that's a great question. Uh, the answer is the strongest, most robust, understanding of what scripture has to say is the best for all people and that includes the community which you refer if you want historical examples of which i doubt you know matthew anderson the pastor of berean presbyterian in philadelphia oberlin grad went to princeton established a bank for the community because the black community in philly could not get loans established a vocational school so they could do more than just menial labor like they were stuck doing because they were always getting a short end of the stick an employment service a medical clinic and a summer resort, summer resort so folks could go and not have to experience racism and bigotry. Even Du Bois applauded Matthew Anderson. His wife was one of the first black women in America to become a physician. Look up Matthew Anderson, and if you want to – this is near and dear to my heart. I preached a sermon on the man, a Presbyterian reformer, and he's not the only example of reformed Christians that I would point to. You got uh, my man Jupiter, a famous poet. You got Phyllis Wheatley. You got Equiana. The list goes on and on. And so you want to know who's done something for the community? It hasn't been all these get-rich-quick schemes and a lot of the stuff you see on TV. And honestly, it hasn't really been the Hebrew Israelites. It's the historic black church, and you can look through the pages of history and find it. It's not just Martin Luther King. It's way deeper and way bigger than that. Francis Grimke. Look, the reason I know this is because I did a series. Everyone look this up. 30 Black Christians You Should Know. It's a complete edition. Look it up, UrbanTheologianRadio.com, and you'll see that this is real stuff we're talking about. That since day one, since jump, a reformed doctrine, a strong view of God's sovereignty has been helpful, uh, and it still is. And uh, that's why there's been a resurgence of neo-reformed or neo-Calvinism theology 
within this community, and I just got back from a conference in Philly called Thriving, which is filled with reformed black Christians where they did urban apologetics. So the thing is, y'all just ain't aware. And so you put all this lack of knowledge about evangelicalism and its broadness on me. You just don't really know what's going on. And so you can't turn on TV and tell me that's all that's going on because it's not. You go respond, Juan. Yeah, so what I would say is that um, even though we see that uh, there are some uh, black Christian churches that are doing good for the community, we should not cease it there. Um, I mean, out here in Atlanta, there's uh, members that are part of my group and the congregation I go through who are doing uh, monumental in the community as well. You know, uh, aside from our food drives, our clothing drives, aside from working certain things in regards to law, working certain things in regards to uh, municipal and corporations and being think tanks for black communities that are formulating uh, political entities in order to safeguard them from any kind of societal ills that may infringe upon their God-given rights. I mean, there's a lot of things that we're doing. There's prison ministries where they give out to prison. So the Hebrews like community has also been doing things, but the difference is, America is not going to give us any acclaim because America does not understand us. If we got the same wealth of support from this nation that black Christian churches do, we could do ten times more than what they are doing. But unfortunately, we have been ridiculed. Unfortunately, we have been overlooked. We have been ostracized. We've been called the black child in regards to people who adhere to this text. So if we are fighting an uphill battle in regards to establishing ourselves and the benefits that we offer to the community simply by being deemed as being heretical by Orthodox Christianity, which is simply unfair. So what I'm saying is just stay tuned very soon, and you're going to see more things, Malone, thanks to social media, of more things that we are doing for the community so we cannot be ruled out as one force that is in the community that's actually bringing some form of change. And I would, I would encourage when we have Malone to go on my YouTube channel and just watch the videos in regards to me talking about reform within the black community. I speak about that all the time. I teach about that all the time nationwide. I instill blueprint plans. I go to marches and protests to get my proactive plan of action. I work in my politics and, and uh, politicians. Excuse me. Um, helping individuals set up community banks and community currency. I mean, these things we are doing. We're doing so many things for the community, but we never get it on TV and will never have the public acclaim because we are simply Israelites and we are ostracized by a Christian nation and we're behind enemy lines. So, again, I'm not taking away from any of those black churches helping, and I would never say black churches are not doing anything for the black community because that would be wrong. But what I will also say is that by proxy of that occurring, you also have to look to see what our smaller community is doing because out of the 46 million African Americans, the majority of them profess to be Christians, and only a small minority are us, Hebrew Israelites. So you're only going to see what so much that we're doing on a wide scale that is that pales in comparison to the black Christian church because they've been under that guise of religion much longer than we have, and we rose up at the same time. When Christianity was introduced to some African Americans in the antebellum South and even before the war in the South, and if we rose parallel to them, then it would be an even race so that we would no foothold for one group to tell the other group that you're wrong and you're evil and you're wicked. But because we are just now springing up and just now waking up, we have a long way to go. But we will get there by the grace of Yah. Study to show thyself approved. And now listen to the Main Talk Be Radio. All right, family. Once again, I appreciate the special guests and everybody that called in to the show, all the questions on social media, all the email questions. You know, uh, you know, time doesn't permit to get, you know, it doesn't permit to get every single question uh, on the phone lines. I wish I could or the emails, but uh, time doesn't permit. But hopefully in the near future, uh, we can probably get both uh, special guests back on the platform. And once again, I appreciate, uh, you know, both special guests for uh, coming up with how to, how to be, the show going to be constructed and, you know, the format. And uh, to me, it was definitely it was a classic. I appreciate both of y'all. But let's get some last words. Let's get some last words to wrap it up. And I was going to vocab. Go ahead, vocab. Last words. 
Yeah, man. I mean, uh, I really uh, enjoy the discussion, and I think uh, it's hopefully helpful. And, you know, I'm uh, down to do more stuff in the future because I don't think there's been all that many types of discussions like this. Now, I already knew, you know, going in, the, just like I'm already seeing on social media, uh, everything is hashtag dagger, hashtag, hashtag uh, cut them, hashtag, you know, killing it, all this stuff. Uh, I knew that going in, um, but I don't do this for the approval of man. I think we had a, a good discussion that can move things forward. And I think a lot of things, not everything, but a lot of things that were unclear were made clear. And I appreciate uh, Ron Shields, you know, going into some nooks and crannies of, of things in relationship to things I've said that I, that I hold to. Uh, he's not trying to just do like a blanket type of thing. And uh, I learned a lot more about what he believed today, which is the purpose, and I hope that it can have uh, ends that are greater than just tonight, ultimately for the glory of God. And with that, I sign out. Shout out to Shield Squad, and I say solely Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. Thanks again, Sal. I appreciate it. And, of course, I believe uh, your information in the description box for those who want to reach out. We appreciate you coming on the platform. Uh, Ron Devon Prospect, last words. Go ahead. Yeah, so what I want to say, I want to give all praise to the Most High Yah for what was performed on tonight. Um, I think the purpose of any discussion where we invoke the scriptures, all praise has to go to the Most High Yah. Um, you know, those of us who are messianic, we also give credit to Yahusha Hamashiach because he is the arbitrator of the renewed covenant, which he was sent by Yah to restore Israel back unto and to preserve them for the end times that's to come. So I definitely want to give praise first and foremost to them. I also want to give uh, praise and thanks to uh, all the people that called in, the people that are supporting Sal's uh, Showtime show, uh, the people who are edified by this discussion with me in, 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 um, in vocab. I want to give uh, honor to vocab for actually stepping into the lion's den, knowing uh, how strong the spirit is in our community and still enduring it to have this fruitful discussion. I look forward to speaking with this brother again. I don't have no ill will towards him. I don't hate the brother. I, I don't need to insult him, though ad hominem. I'm only concerned with the information, and I really just want to know his prime agenda and to let him know that all Hebrew Israelites should not be painted with a, a, a broad stroke brush, that there are some of us that are out there that actually have different functions, just like in the body of Christ and Christianity, there are different ministries with different functions. My objective is to restore the downtrodden people that are here in the Americas and let them know who they are. And with that knowledge, it gives them an awakening into an obligation to serve Yah by being the light unto the nations. And it's not something to say that we're better than anybody else, but we've been set apart and chosen and uplifted above the nations as a beacon and a lighthouse brings the shift that's in darkness right unto bay. That is what we are there for. The construction is no better with the ship than it is with the lighthouse, but both have a function and both have a purpose, and that is what we are here to do on tonight. So even though I may disagree with vocab, he has a function, and that function is to rile our community up to study greater. My function is to show our community that we can be diplomatic and dealing with people with disagreements and still give you all the credit at the end of the day. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, vocab, and thank you for everybody else who joined in.